This is Audible. Help by Simon Amstel. Read by Simon Amstel. For my mum, who birthed me out of her body and then helped me with my jokes. Introduction. I was tricked into this book. I was asked if I'd be interested in having the transcripts of my stand-up published, and rather than saying, thank you, but I don't think there's any need to do this, I said, these words must be written down. And who for? For people who don't like hearing stand-up out loud. I was told part of the deal was I'd have to record an audiobook, and then there'd be a promotional tour where I'd read my stand-up from a book. The only way I could think to get out of this situation was to write something new and so horrifically personal that no one could think of it as anything other than a heroic act of self-annihilation. It's scary telling the truth in a book. In stand-up you can say anything as long as it's funny, but in a book you can say anything. I've written some things that aren't funny at all, and I feel exposed. But better to expose your absurd self than try to protect it. It feels good to have all these stories out of my head, than in a book where they can't confuse me anymore. I got them out of me. Chapter 1. Shy, Funny, Lonely I was so shy as a child I would cling to my mother's leg and scream if she tried to leave me somewhere like a birthday party or a school. I was terrified of anything that wasn't being at home. I remember Adam Edwards inviting me to his fifth birthday party and I said I was busy. Sorry Adam, let me check my diary. Oh, it's just impossible, I'm in Berlin. I really hoped I'd have a sister at some point because I was going to be too shy to find someone to marry. If there could just be someone born in this house so I could settle down with, that would be ideal. My mum and dad were advised by Mrs Posner at the school parents' evening to send me to a Saturday morning stage school called Stardust to bring me out of my shell. I guess I must have said I don't want to go to Stardust, as I remember my mum saying, what if I promise to sit outside the whole time you're there? I have no memory of anything that happened in that class, just walking in and looking back at my mum sat in the corridor. Yet something magical must have happened. I guess a bunch of stardust was sprinkled over my terrified head because after a few months, I began to feel comfortable volunteering to be on stage. I learned that performing in front of a group of people was safe, though I still wasn't able to deal with one person at a time. At this point, I may have unconsciously decided that finding one person to be in a relationship with was going to be impossible, so getting better at performing in order to become famous was essential. And then I'd never be lonely because there'd always be fan mail. I bought a new flat about two years ago. In this flat, in the bathroom, there were two sinks. I thought that would bring me some joy. (laughs) It is a constant reminder. (laughs) And so what I've had to do, this is what I'm doing now in my life. I'm actually doing this. I'm using both sinks. I now, every day, brush my teeth in the left sink and in the right one, Mainly cry. (laughs) At 11, I was too old for Stardust and began attending the Harlequin Theatre School and Agency. I may not have continued my Saturday morning stage school education, but my favourite TV show, The Big Breakfast, had just started and looked like the most fun anyone could have. More than fun, it was unconventional. It looked like freedom. I still didn't have any conscious understanding of why I needed to be so free, but I took every class that Harlequin offered. Presenting a TV show wasn't taught at Harlequin, so I studied Chris Evans. I began to dress like him, even though he dressed like a clown. I hosted my own version of The Big Breakfast in my bedroom, doing links into a camcorder while holding a clipboard and making jokes about members of a crew who cheered me in my head. I did anything that I thought could be a way into the television. Despite not being able to sing, I got the role of Pharaoh in Joseph in the annual school musical, and I put all my energy into being as funny as possible while repressing some very confusing feelings for Joseph. I learned to juggle and became very upset when my mum refused to let me have a unicycle for my birthday. Eddie Izzard had been a street performer before he became a famous comedian, and if I couldn't unicycle, I felt it could hold me back. I went to see TV shows being filmed. My mum and I went to watch the National Lottery, even though it only lasted 15 minutes. I was thrilled by cameras moving across a floor. We went to watch the Vanessa Feltz show together, and I felt sure that despite it being a show presented by a woman in her 40s, four women in their 40s, and called the Vanessa Feltz show, I should really be the host. The subject up for debate that day was, should I... Murder my husband. (laughs) At the beginning of the show, the floor manager told us that the best opinion today will win a bottle of champagne. So there's everything to play for. Should she or shouldn't she murder her husband? 20 minutes go by and people say some very interesting things. And I, at about 14 years old, stand up and say, I think you shouldn't murder your husband because you could go to prison. And I won a bottle of champagne. (laughs) At 13, I did my first stand-up gig at the Harlequin Biannual Variety Show. 
Two years earlier, I had sung and danced in the Chicago number Razzle Dazzle, wearing a silver sequin waistcoat and a matching top hat. I was actually the stand-in for a former student who didn't have time for the rehearsals, but apparently was going to perform the song on the night. I assumed he wouldn't turn up, but when the night came, he was placed centre stage and I was given a spot on the side, which was sold as generous. There was no need for me to be included, but I could dance along in the corner, dressed as a small version of the main singer, like a little monkey person. By the time my second chance at making a name for myself at the Harlequin Variety Show came around, I wouldn't even let puberty get in the way. My body kept trying to tell me that I fancied boys and I had other stuff to deal with. My bar mitzvah, my parents' divorce, the biannual variety show. I didn't feel there was also time to fall for Leonardo DiCaprio from Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. Better to begin a stand-up career and get into the television. Having now checked the dates, it seems Romeo and Juliet didn't actually come out until I was 17, so this is a false memory, and I apologise. I think the truth is I managed to repress any sexual thoughts from even awakening until I was 17, and then rendered helpless by the moving image of Leonardo DiCaprio's hair falling over his eyes as some fish swam by. It's possible I could have seen What's Eating Gilbert Grape at 13, but I think I only discovered Leo's early work much later. I'd go to the video shop and rent out every film with DiCaprio in. I remember thinking, there's going to be a record of this, it's a worry. People will say, you're in love with Leonardo DiCaprio, it says so on your video club card. When Titanic came out, I went to see it four times. Aside from the sexual attraction, I connected to the story of money getting in the way of love. My mum had remarried, and I didn't like this new stepfather character. I took my mum and grandma to the cinema to show them that true love was more important than financial security. At the end of the film, my grandma said, How could she leave such a rich man? He gave her a huge diamond and she left him for a boy who lived under a bridge? All he had was a pencil! Along with my DiCaprio premonition, I definitely had some complicated feelings for one of the boys at Harlequin. I hoped I was just impressed with his piano playing and ended up being groped in a shopping centre by his girlfriend. I wasn't sure why it was happening. She just kept grabbing my penis. We were supposed to be shopping. I was happy that she liked me because I thought it meant I was as attractive as her boyfriend, even though I couldn't play the piano. And if she liked me, was it possible that he could want me too? But did I actually want him? Or did I just want to learn the piano? I definitely didn't want to be molested by this girl in the shopping centre, but that's what I got. Meanwhile, two years after the Razzle Dazzle debacle, the drama teacher told the whole group that there was a problem with the biannual variety show. He said the big tap number has been scheduled next to the big ballet number and both dances will be performed by the same dancers in different shoes. Rather than changing the running order or making the bold choice of presenting a ballet number featuring children in tap shoes or a tap number that nobody would hear, they thought if they could just cover the shoe change with something in front of the curtain for five minutes, everything would be fine. I'd been watching a lot of stand-up comedy on Late Night Channel 4, mainly quite peculiar American and Canadian comedians at what must have been the Montreal Comedy Festival. They offered the same sense of freedom I felt watching The Big Breakfast. I don't think I understood what was going on or why any of it was funny, but it felt like something exciting was happening in Canada. All I really knew was that stand-up comedy was one person on a stage having an incredible time doing whatever they wanted and receiving a wild amount of what sounded like love. I had a powerful impulse to get that five-minute spot. These Saturday morning drama classes were where I felt most safe and happy. I think I knew that if I could be a comedian, I could really be in control of something. I said to the drama teacher, what about stand-up comedy? And he said, do you mean you doing stand-up comedy? I said, yeah, casually, like it was a fairly reasonable suggestion. And incredibly, he didn't say, are you sure, Simon? You know, stand-up comedy is quite tricky and you are a child. I have a wall in my flat now of various comedic inspirations. And the, the whole wall is a lie because I didn't know who any of these people were on my wall when I was 13. If there was any truth to that wall, I'd just be putting up a sign that reads, parents divorced, learn to juggle to stop mother crying. <laughs> Why did nobody put a piano in front of me as a child? Then I could be a guy now who can play the piano in a bar, taking requests. There are no requests with juggling other than, don't juggle. <laughs> So at 13, a vulnerable age when a lot of young people go into themselves and become shy, I'd done shy already, and stand-up comedy didn't feel that scary. What felt scary was being fascinated with the way Leonardo DiCaprio's hair fell over his eyes, even though I hadn't seen it yet. I must have known it was coming. Quick, we need something to distract from all that beautiful hair blowing in the wind of the future. In preparation for my first stand-up set, I wrote some jokes and also stole bits from the Channel 4 shows I'd been watching. One guy had a bunch of enormous cards with words written on them. He showed a card with the word this to the audience and said, Would you look at this? Has anyone ever seen this before? Then he grabbed another card with the word that on it and shouted, What about that? I bet you weren't expecting that. I thought this is brilliant and did his act word for word. I also wrote some original material. I have a strong memory of one specific line. You're born, you go to school, you get a job, you get married, you have children, and then you die. 
What's the point of that? Not a funny line, but I thought it would be a good one to begin this book with to show that I was an incredibly profound existential child prodigy. I found the VHS tape of the show and the line isn't there. I think I may have made the memory up. According to the tape, which we must trust, I walk on stage very confidently despite a multicoloured waistcoat and say this. What about any green people? Have we got any green people tonight? You know, those environmentalists who care more about recycling their toilet paper than actually using it. <laughs> it makes my stomach tense watching it. Why is this boy making fun of people trying to save the planet? Why is he doing some bits in an American accent? There must have also been some old 70s style comedians still on TV because some of the jokes I did were about Irish and German people. Did I even contemplate the meaninglessness of life at 13 or was I just a normal child? No, I was doing stand-up at 13. I must have been profoundly deep and certainly troubled. Maybe there was a rehearsal where the drama teacher suggested my line wouldn't go down that well because everyone in the audience had jobs, children and would die. I think that must be it. I was a censored child genius who understood the absurd, meaningless nature of existence and not just an oddly dressed xenophobe. There was just enough laughter to make me feel like I really wanted to do it again. Watching the tape now, it seems that a lot of that laughter was nervous and confused. It occurs to me that I hadn't actually been introduced as a comedian, so they probably thought I was doing a monologue from a play about a racist. After that, I did stand-up at a local charity show, I entered competitions for new comedians, and I was booked for my first TV gig on Good Morning with Anne and Nick, doing an impression of Dave Medner Everidge. I was in the television. I'd never be lonely again. Chapter 2. Acceptance. When I was 15, and this happened when I was 15, but I think it's too odd a story if I was 15, so I think it's better if we say I was 11. <laughs> I was in my grandparents' house, and I used to have quite a good relationship with my grandma. She used to really validate me in my life. I used to do little drawings and doodles, and she'd say, oh, that's nice, I'd do another drawing. Oh, that's nice, another drawing. Oh, that's nice, and at one point, I distrusted the consistency of her reviews. <laughs> so did a deliberately bad drawing to see what she would say. She said, oh, that's nice. And I thought, I can't deal with this inauthentic sycophant. So one day, and I know now that I did this because I wanted to do something where she couldn't validate it, where she couldn't say, oh, that's nice. But when I did it, it was purely unconscious. It was purely in the moment. One day, I ran up to my grandma and I mooned my grandma. <laughs> but I was only 11, I'm just 11. <laughs> It wasn't even like a, a cheeky, playful, little moon and runaway, funny, funny. It was a violent bend over. <laughs> Here's my arsehole grandma. And apparently a bit of balls as well. A little bit of balls. <laughs> not only did I not know why I was mooning my grandma in the moment of the mooning, I also wasn't sure while talking about it on stage. I now think of this as a story about a young gay person in Essex testing whether something shocking and unacceptable could still be met with love. I think everything I've ever done in front of an audience has been a version of showing my grandma my bottom. Frustrated, and I suppose scared by the conventional, I spend a lot of energy on stage and off fretting about how much of who I am will be tolerated before I'm rejected. When I was 18, I was working as a presenter on the kids' cable channel Nickelodeon, introducing shows like Rugrats and feeling worried that I may be a homosexual. There were no gay people that I knew of at Nickelodeon, but I wasn't really looking. I was mostly just very happy to be a presenter, reading from a clipboard, talking to a puppet and saying, here's Rugrats, with enough enthusiasm to make the crew cheer. But what to do about being gay? I secretly got on the train to Paris to see if boys were worth the hassle of ruining my life. I told no one. I was living on my own in a flat in Ilford, having been thrown out of the house by my stepfather because my mum didn't like Titanic. I bought a time-out guide to Paris and hid it in the back of my wardrobe just in case anyone came round. I thought the fear of being gay could be responsible for creating these overpowering gay feelings. This made sense at the time, even though people who are scared of heights don't also have an intense sexual urge to sit on a roof. I thought if I just went somewhere and did something, I could move on with my life. And the boys I fancied tended to look like girls anyway, so I thought if I can just find a girl with short hair and no breasts, I'll probably be alright. It was a great plan, and it would have all worked out if it hadn't been for those pesky dicks. I packed a small black t-shirt, hair gel, and contact lenses, because I thought that's what they'll like a skinny boy with spiky hair and the illusion of good eyesight. As soon as I arrived, I changed in the bathroom of the train station. Looking at myself in the mirror as I put my contact lenses in, it freaked me out that nobody knew I was there. I thought I could just die here and nobody would know why. All he had on him was hair gel. What was his plan? 
I remember talking to myself in the mirror. Are you okay? I think so. Are you okay? I don't know. Maybe we're okay. I got in a cab to the club I'd circled in my time out guide, La Queen. There was a woman on the door who said it opens at 10 and doesn't really get going until 1. It was 8 o'clock. I nervously walked up and down the street, mumbling to myself for hours. I was hopefully going to kiss a boy, but I was also going to be very tired. Eventually, it was an appropriate time to arrive at the club. I went in and wasn't quite sure what to do other than drink a lot. I'd never been to a nightclub before. I went on a lad's holiday to Magaluf at 17 with some equally awkward friends, but we were too scared to go clubbing. We didn't understand how anyone could just walk into a building and then transition from standing still and talking to stopping the talking and beginning the dancing. We discussed this for many hours while sitting on a wall outside a club. I assumed because I was young and skinny, someone in Paris would approach me and tell me who I was, but no one did. This is so strange to me now because that vulnerable 18-year-old boy, even to this day, is my type. I wish I'd been there for me. I did a lot of walking around the enormous club over the next two hours and eventually saw a really cute boy. I felt just brave or drunk enough to go up to him and say the French for will you kiss me, a phrase I'd written on a small piece of paper and memorised. I tapped him on the shoulder and he quickly turned around. I asked... Allez-vous, mon brasseur? And he kissed me. I still remember thinking, as he was kissing me, oh yes, gay. It felt like the kind of kiss that I was supposed to be involved in. And then it stopped. He started speaking in French and tried to give me his phone number before running off. I should have learned the French, for I'm only here for one night. I followed him until we found a translator. I still can't believe my French wasn't better when just two years earlier I achieved an A-star in my French GCSE oral exam for sentences like Mon père travaille dans le banc. My dad didn't work in a bank, but I couldn't figure out how to say my father runs a courier company and thought, who's going to check? The boy left, with no idea what he'd done for me. I thought I could probably go home at this point, but then decided that I'd come all this way and my hair was still quite pointy. I felt confident now, I knew exactly what I wanted, and half an hour later, I saw somebody else. Not quite as cute, but he could speak English, which was useful. I asked, can we go somewhere? He said he had some people in his apartment, but had an idea. I asked, what's your idea? And then he took me to a canal where I lost my virginity. And then, and this is the most disgusting and romantic sentence I have for you, we washed the cum off our hands in the fountains of Paris. Thank you. But here's the sad bit. I think if I'd slept with the first boy I kissed that night, I could have got on the train home and come out immediately. Instead, because the chemistry wasn't quite there by the canal, I was left thinking I could probably live without that kind of thing and didn't touch another person for three years. I started going to a terrible nightclub in Romford with my old school friends who had since learned how to transition from standing still and talking to stopping the talking and beginning the dancing. I felt it was very important to stay in contact with my old school friends in Essex, perhaps so I could avoid being myself in London. Even when I spoke about this years later on stage, I didn't deal with the reason why I went clubbing in Romford, just the frustration. Three years between the ages of 18 and 21. Three years every Saturday night in Romford. Three years every Saturday night in Romford. Three years. (laughs) Because nobody told me that London was close. And you had to wear black trousers to get in, black shoes, an untucked shirt. And I, I don't like it when the dress code is basic dick. I think it's, <laughs> it's restricting. One time, I don't know if I was being rebellious or if, if I just thought it would be okay, I wore black trainers. I thought that would be all right. And the bouncer looked at me and said, you can't come in like that. You like come from a gym. <laughs> Which gym do I look like I've come from? <laughs> He's such, a, he's such a basic human being. Tim, there's only two forms of dress, club and gym. <laughs> I wish I could go back and give myself a hug. Two years later, I was about to be sacked from Nickelodeon for becoming too sarcastic for kids' TV. The boss told me he'd have to ask me to leave unless I could go back to Perky. I remember being very depressed doing some Christmas links because a year had gone by and I still hadn't worked out how to make them funny. The director sent me home because I looked so sad. She was quite compassionate, but the puppet was very angry. I was terrified that it was the end of everything I'd ever wanted. I was so young and looked even younger. I didn't know where else I could be employed. Then, just before I was officially asked to leave, I did an interview with the pop star Mandy Moore, the last in a long line of new Britney Spearses. I think a combination of not having a full crew available for the shoot and laughing with a researcher beforehand whilst reading Mandy Moore's official biography meant that I felt just relaxed enough to discover a new way of being on camera that felt completely natural. I felt funny. I think I knew I was doing an impression of Ruby Wax, but somehow also felt like I'd found myself. I edited the interview and sent the tape to various agents. Joanna Kay was incredibly enthusiastic, which was quite fortunate because none of the other agents got back to me and I was about to be fired. 
Halfway through our meeting, Gabby Roslin from The Big Breakfast walked in and I felt like everything was going to be okay. Joanna took me on, but the man in charge of Nickelodeon told me I would definitely have to go. He said I could stay until I found a new job, which was very upsetting at the time, but now seems incredibly kind. Meanwhile, Joanna put me up for a new pop show on Channel 4. She felt sure I was exactly what they were looking for, but also suggested I get some new clothes as they were looking for someone stylish. At 21, I was presenting Pop World on actual terrestrial television. I was so happy, but quickly realised that at some point on the television, my co-presenter was going to say something like, Justin Timberlake is very attractive, and I would have to say something like, I don't know what you mean. So, two months into Pop World, I decided to go to Miami to properly figure out who I was. I think I'd seen the film The Birdcage and thought, that's where they are. I didn't know anything. I could have gone to New York, San Francisco. I could have gone to London. I went to a club on the first night I arrived, but didn't see anyone I fancied, so I went back to the hotel. On the second night, I went to another club and saw somebody with the kind of transcendent hair that made my teenage years so confusing. I got very drunk and circled the room. He was standing next to someone and I thought I shouldn't interrupt. I kept going round and round, getting more and more drunk, until eventually I was able to go up to him and say, Are you with him? He said no, and we ended up in the back seat of his friend's car being driven back to his apartment. It didn't need to be any more exciting than this, but then he took out his penis and cheekily smiled at me. I thought, I can't do this, I'm on Channel 4. But then I felt scared I might not get the opportunity again, and as I was sucking his penis, I remember thinking, oh yes, gay. His apartment was really cool, and he was slim but incredibly toned, which made me notice for the first time that I was just slim. He was 28, his name was Kurt, and he had the accent of all my childhood crushes. I don't know what we did that first night, but it must have been good, because I stayed for three nights. I was so pleased to finally be having sex in a bed. We spent the entire time alternating between sex and old episodes of the Golden Girls. I was very fortunate to have arrived in America during a Golden Girls marathon. At some point I thought, I've booked a hotel, I can't waste the room, and so we said our goodbyes. Half a day later, I began to miss him. I called, and he said he'd be missing me too. I went back to the apartment, and we spent the rest of the week together. Despite all this, I still couldn't quite say that I was gay. I told Kurt I thought I was probably bisexual, and he asked, when you masturbate, what do you think of? I said, right, it's a good point. For some reason, we ended up talking about celebrities being in the closet, and how if there were confused and terrified children in the world committing suicide, it was not okay for someone in a position of influence to be silent. At the end of the week, Kurt drove me to the airport and we hugged goodbye. Something real had happened. A few days after I arrived home, my mum and younger brother Robert came over to my flat. I was determined to tell them about this boy, but after about two hours of talking about Miami and just responding no to the question, did you meet any nice girls, my mum went to get something from the car. Standing by the window, I said to my brother, I met a boy in Miami. What do you think? I'm about to tell mum. Should I tell her? He said no. When she came back, I said, I didn't meet a girl in Miami, but I did meet a boy. She said, you're joking. And I said, no. Tell me you're joking. 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 I'm joking. Are you? No. My mum finally said, let me just think about it for a few days, like she was going to figure something out. I said, didn't you know? I went to a drama club. I did tap dancing. And she said, don't stereotype. I was told not to tell anyone else, especially anyone in the family. And I cried that night. I had to make myself cry because I wasn't used to it, but it felt like the right thing to do. I sat cross-legged on my bed and wished that my mum could have been better. I think really she must have known, because when I was 16, she asked if I'd been searching for gay porn on my stepdad's computer. Luckily, I'd just seen an old film called A Guide for the Married Man, where Joey Bishop gets away with sleeping with another woman by repeatedly denying that the woman lying in their bed is even there. So when my mum asked about the porn, I just kept repeating phrases like, of course not, what are you talking about? And I don't know why it's on his computer. Maybe it's his. Like, my mum and I have got a good relationship, but there's a detachment, there's an inauthenticity to every conversation. I feel like I should be able to tell her anything, but there's a sort of awkwardness to it on the phone. And I think it's because I came out of her vagina. And that's (laughs) sort of always there, you know? Oh, have you done your counter attack, Simon? Mum, I came out of your vagina. Let's not pretend that's a normal thing to have happened. (laughs) I came out of your vagina, I sucked on your tits. You want to talk about tax? With my grandma as well, who I got on with quite well. Still an awkwardness, I think it's because my mum came out of her, I came out of my mum, it's like a Russian doll awkwardness. I decided I needed to tell my agent who I was, to check if I was going to be able to stay in show business. I walked into her office and asked if we could have a quick chat. I was nervous, but came up with the sentence, how do you feel about bisexuality as a career move? She said, this is great. Gay people are always the most talented, completely ignoring the fact that I was bisexual. I said, what about 
I don't want it to be the main thing about me, you know, but I'm on this pop show and if Makita, the girl I was presenting the show with, says she fancies someone, I want to be able to say that too. Joanna's response, well, you should just do that then. On my first day back at work, before we started recording, in an attempt to make an announcement that didn't seem like a big announcement, I managed to come out to everyone in such a garbled way that no one heard. I looked around the room and noticed the only person who had actually spotted what had happened was a new runner. He was looking at me, wondering what I was going to do next. He seemed to suggest with his eyes that I try again. So I did, and this time everyone heard, but no one believed me. Makita, who grew up in London around all kinds of exciting people, looked at me and said, Trust me, you're not. On air, I attempted to subtly drop in the occasional sentence about liking a boy, which was incredibly clunky, as I was trying to make something that at the time felt like quite a big deal, not a big deal. Eventually it became as irrelevant as everything on that show, but it took a while. Meanwhile, after months of emailing and talking on the phone with Kurt, we arranged to meet up again in New York. We decided that if this went well, he'd come to London and move in with me, which I agreed to mainly out of politeness. I didn't know how to say, that seems a bit crazy, don't come to London. So instead I said, yeah, you should come to London because I live in London. The other problem was I lived in Ilford, which was not London. Before he arrived, I went into a mild panic that my flat wasn't what he'd be expecting and started pulling up carpet and sanding floors. He was leaving this beautiful wood-floored apartment in Miami for a flat in Ilford with net curtains. Net curtains that weren't there when I moved in. I put them up. He waited a month before saying, you know, this isn't London. I said, it's on the central line. Living with Kurt meant there was now an enormous lie I was telling everyone in my family. Either I must have been too subtle on TV for anyone to notice, or none of them were watching. I had always talked to my aunt and grandma on the phone at least once a week, and I began to feel sad about the bit in the conversation where I wouldn't say that I was living with someone. And because I wasn't very good at talking without being funny, when my aunt would say, what did you get up to last night? I'd say, I went to a big gay nightclub, and she'd laugh. This went on for a month until it was clear that I wasn't joking, and she summoned me to her house. I searched the internet for things to say to family members to reassure them that everything would be fine, and had some key sentences in my pocket. I knew it would all be quite strange and new for everyone, but I'd never felt so free and hoped they'd see how happy I was. When I arrived, my tense-looking aunt opened the door and said, Don't make a fuss. I was taken into the living room where my mum was waiting with my uncle. The doors were closed so their children couldn't hear what was going on, and then my aunt started crying and didn't stop for two hours. It was so overwhelming I forgot my sentences from the internet. My aunt's tears made her the most vulnerable person in the room, and suddenly the only thing of any importance was finding a way to stop the crying. I think the hope was that I would change my mind. They were very worried I'd be bullied, that I'd have a terrible life, and I was sat there thinking, this is the worst thing that's happened so far. My uncle, an accountant, gave me a book written by a client of his, A Gay Man's Guide to Safer Sex, Fingering, Fucking and Fisting. Thank you, Graham. He must have flicked through it because he then asked, are you douching? I was 21 and didn't know what douching was, so I said, of course I'm douching, we're all douching. Eventually I was allowed to leave, as long as I agreed I wouldn't tell my grandparents because it would kill them. Because it's genuinely believed in this family that when my mum got divorced, which was quite a drama, it was the direct reason for my grandpa becoming diabetic. So, <laughs> how can there still be homophobia when Elton John wrote The Lion King? <laughs> I hated having to lie to my grandparents. I missed a Christmas with my family because I couldn't bring my boyfriend. Eventually I said to my grandma on the phone, I keep not saying something to you. And when I finally managed to say it out loud, she panicked and hung up and died. She didn't die. My grandparents actually turned out to be much less traumatised than anyone. My grandpa was particularly sweet with a photography student I went out with. They discussed exposure rates at a family lunch and I almost cried. Then there was my dad, who I didn't get the chance to tell because my mum wanted to see the look on his face. I have a father who's very religious now. He didn't used to be, but then I guess my parents divorced and he was searching for something structured and fulfilling. For a long time he was just canoeing. <laughs> That's my mum laughing. <laughs> Still, still there. <laughs> and we wouldn't have the problems that we have with our father if it had just, if it had just been a bit better at canoeing. <laughs> or drowned. But... After she told him, I was asked to come over and he suggested some kind of therapy. He denies it was electroshock therapy, but he definitely gave me a flyer for something. At one point, a couple of orthodox Jews knocked on the door and walked in, 
I thought, am I about to be taken away by Jews and electrocuted? But they were collecting for charity, so I was okay. I said to him, we've never really discussed this properly. We've always just tried to keep the peace for the sake of a relationship. But what is, it's called such a rift. What is the problem? What's the sentence in the Torah that is the issue for homosexuality? And, we, you know, we can deal with this. He didn't want to discuss it. So I said, well, I've got it in front of me. And one of the problems seems to be that it says, you should put me to death. <laughs> then he says, well, that's not my responsibility. <laughs> so not, let's disregard that sentence. Yes, that is what should happen, Simon, but I've got a lot on. <laughs> I tried years ago to find something to make him feel comfortable. I thought, let's go, let's go to him. Let's make him feel okay with me. I found in the Torah, in the book of Samuel, and Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing. They kissed each other and wept together until David became great. <laughs> Unfortunately, at that point, the Bible pans to a shot of a fireplace, but... <laughs> I can't feel too annoyed with these people. They just happen to be from a particular generation, living in a particular place, and from their perspective, a hardcore sex book and electroshock therapy were generous gifts. I think I knew that none of it was personal. My aunt, uncle and father also treated my brother like a deviant loon for finding a non-Jewish girlfriend. This was handy for me, as I found it much less painful to be angry with them for upsetting him than for rejecting me. At my grandpa's 70th birthday party, I caused a major drama and then spoke about it in my stand-up, which also didn't help. Everyone was there, apart from my brother's girlfriend, who he's been with for about four years. She was not there on account of a couple of the family members having a problem with her not being a Jew. We mustn't judge them for this. This is just because... It's just because they personally have a very strong belief in racism. So... <laughs> I say to these members of my family, in as sort of sweet and polite a way as possible, isn't it a shame that my brother couldn't bring his girlfriend tonight? It's sort of a shame, isn't it? It's sort of a shame. And they get quite defensive, of course, and say, well, why isn't she here? We thought she would be here. Why isn't she here? And I say, oh, isn't it... I don't know, isn't it because of that time that you said she can't be here? <laughs> and I say, I ask, just explain to me, why is the belief more important than the feelings of a human being? And it's so sad because she's a brunette, she could pass. <laughs> and then my brother comes over and just starts swearing at them and it becomes a bit intense and I say oh no it's alright calm down I've been on a course and, <laughs> and my grandpa this is just the point where the cake is supposed to come we should be singing happy birthday and now my grandpa is crying partly because of the drama that I've created and partly because he can't eat the cake <laughs> and uh yeah, it's a tricky business. The whole thing's a tricky business. It is then suggested that we all go back to my mum's house and resolve this. And I feel very awkward about the whole thing because we don't have drama in this family and now I've created one and I've got to resolve it. We've got to have this whole debate about who's right and who's wrong. When I was younger, I went to see the Vanessa Feltz talk show being filmed. <laughs> There's nothing we can do. It happened. It happened. <laughs> Their perspective was that it was a terrible misunderstanding and the one time they did meet her, she hadn't said hello to them. And I had to explain that she was the shy new guest coming into this family. We are hosting her. We have to say hello first. That's how it works. Why can't we learn from Lumiere, the candlestick holder from Beauty and the Beast, <laughs> who sang, be our guest, be our guest, not is she a Jew? <laughs> They said, it's not our fault, it's your mother. She would rather that he was with a Jewish girl. And my mum said, no, that's not what I've said. What I've said is in an ideal world, he would be, but I'm happy that he's happy. Which sounds more positive, but she's creating a whole other world there where he's with someone else. <laughs> so I said, we've got to let go of this idea of an ideal world. The world is how you perceive it. It's ideal if you want it to be ideal. And they're in love. Surely love is the ideal. And I want a bottle of champagne. <laughs> 
The problem with needing people to love you despite who you are is that you end up subtly compromising for them and so internalise their prejudice and their rage. Rather than let them reject you, you allow all their nonsense to live inside you. You don't realise it, but you agree to feel uncomfortable about this bit of yourself too. Just slightly, just enough to keep them in your life. You settle for being mildly content with who you are, rather than proud or thrilled, and any attempts at love will be thwarted by this refusal to love yourself completely. I should have known that impressing my family with my romantic life was going to be unlikely, but when I broke up with Kurt after two years, I felt a real need to be a good gay. I didn't want to be predatory or promiscuous or any of the judgmental words I used to shame myself away from any kind of fun. Sex can just be fun. It can just be fun. It can just be fun. <laughs> no one ever says, oh, you're playing all that tennis. Where's it leading? <laughs> At school, I'd been such a good boy. My mum always told me that as a baby, I was no bother. As an adult, I was a bother and I wanted to minimise this as much as possible. I became so befuddled by what was appropriate or good that when I was 24, I made the mistake of assuming I was in a relationship with someone who I'd had sex with twice. He eventually felt the need to say to me, I'm worried you think this is a relationship. I said, yes, what else would it be? He told me he wasn't ready for a relationship and didn't want to hurt me. He tried to kiss me goodbye and I was so angry and confused I refused the kiss. I really liked him and couldn't understand how I'd been dumped by someone who'd approached me at a party. He came up to me. I thought, if you're not ready for a relationship, don't talk to people. Stay at home and prepare. My friend suggested he maybe just wanted to have some fun. So I called him and left a message on his voicemail saying, Hey, I think we should just have fun. Let's have fun. I'm fun. He didn't call back, and I felt sad for a year. I should have had a lot more sex in the past when there were these opportunities that I missed because I was so frigid and terrified. I remember being at a party, and... I was in a room with three attractive men, and one of them turned to me and said, we should have an orgy. And I said, ha! <laughs> this is a nice room. And that was it, then that was it. <laughs> and I can't go back now. Even if somebody suggested an orgy now, and please do. <laughs> it's my personality that's the problem. What I bring to a social setting is humor, and nobody wants to be sarcastically fellated. <laughs> People don't want to be ironically fingered. You've got to commit to that. <laughs> you would think, though, people of London, that if you had some regret about not having more adventure, sexual adventure in the past, you'd make sure you had it in the present. I went to see this piece of immersive theatre where you wander around five floors of a building and it's dark. People are wearing masks. There's this feeling of anonymity, like anything can happen without consequence. And there's a bar area with an actor playing the role of the barman. Although he was also a barman. <laughs> and he came up to me and he said, would you like to go on an adventure? And there's this feeling of anonymity, like anything could happen without consequence. And I say, what would that involve? <laughs> of course he won't tell me, so I walk away terrified, then I realise this is a fictional adventure, and I go back after about an hour and say, look, I'm ready, whatever it is, I'm ready for my adventure. He speaks to the lady in charge, he comes back and he says, it's too late. And that's the end of that story. <laughs> what am I going to do? I'm going to lead a mundane life and then just die. And I think I'm okay because I live in London. But the truth is, you can't really appreciate anything fully if you live in London because there's so much going on. Like this tonight, right now, and this is quite an intimate space. And I'm quite famous, but... <laughs> just another night for you, just another... It's probably one of, like, three interesting things you're doing this weekend, if not... People in Sheffield would lose their minds. <laughs> I really wanted to be a person in a long-term relationship and eventually found someone who I couldn't leave. He was very young and beautiful. I was 25 and deranged. I decided his glowing skin and shiny hair meant he was pure and I would need to do my best to pretend to be. He was a very sweet, lovable person and what follows are the worst parts of the relationship. What makes for good stand-up tends to be the bits of life that go wrong. So while listening to the rest of this chapter, please try to imagine two people who are quite often having a lovely time. We, um, we were in a supermarket together and a friend of his, who I hadn't met before, approached us. And because I hadn't met this guy before, I got instantly nervous. The friend says, oh, what are you up to? And I say, oh, a bit of shopping. We've got a pineapple. <laughs> 
an hour passes, and then the boyfriend says to me, what's wrong with you? Why do you, have to, why do you have to try to be so funny all the time? I said, well, it wasn't, it wasn't funny, it was factual. It was, it was, there was a part, he says, you deliberately chose the most humorous objects in the trolley. <laughs> well, I'm gifted. <laughs> I completely lost myself. He taught me how to dress, but eventually didn't let me leave the flat unless I was wearing what he'd suggested. So I looked great, but in prison. I once met him on Oxford Street. I was wearing a colourful woolly hat, and he looked incredibly troubled by it. He said, what are you doing? You need to take that off. I said, it's okay, I don't think it's cool, it's funny, because I'm funny. He needed me to take the hat off, so I took it off. And then I was gone which I thought may be a good thing because I've become quite interested in Buddhism where losing the self is nirvana. If you can attain no self, then there can be no suffering. No hat, no self, no suffering. But I didn't become a transcendent Buddha. I became an abused housewife with a cold head. The only thing I've really learned about relationships is you have to make the person feel special because we do have egos. And with everything that I was reading about Buddhism, that there's no self, you can't bring that stuff into your relationship. You can't say to the person you're with, I love you. But if you think about it, I could love anyone. Understandably, he felt I should be less detached and more in love. I wasn't at a point in my life where I could let myself be vulnerable enough to love or be loved. I wouldn't have even known what that sentence meant. All I knew was that if I couldn't love a boy this beautiful, I probably couldn't love anyone. I believe he had anxious, preoccupied attachment, which means that he needed me to be a lot more present than I could be, listening to every word, which would have been fine, except I had dismissive avoidant attachment, which means that often I'd be in a room with him and say, what are you doing today? And just as he started to answer, I'd walk out the room. But being uncool wasn't the problem in the relationship. The problem at its heart was being uncommitted. I wasn't committed to the relationship. And I didn't feel I could just express that lack of commitment, I felt I just had to lie and show how committed I was all the time. And so I would just do little things to show how committed I was. Like one time, I bought a flat with him. Just before we bought the flat, I tried to tell a friend how worried I was, but didn't yet have the capacity to be sincere, so tried to make my anxiety funny. Should I really be moving in with him? What's the alternative? I can't be alone in my flat forever. It's decorated. There's nothing left to do. I can't keep wandering around London buying new cushions. There'll be too many cushions. I was terrified of ending up alone forever. Even though when I was five, I learned a powerful lesson which I must have forgotten. I was at the back of the garden, and a chair collapsed on my finger. I screamed for help, but no one could hear, so I stopped screaming because I realised I'm alone. We had quite different expectations regarding money. He'd been brought up with money, and I didn't yet understand the concept of buying things that weren't necessary. I was only 26. Someone could have said, have fun, have sex, meet some nice people you want to spend time with. Don't move in with someone whose intense beauty and passion bewilder you. Why don't you ever buy me flowers? He once asked as part of an argument about why I never did anything lovely. I didn't know why I hadn't ever bought him flowers, but eventually came up with, I didn't grow up with flowers. We didn't even have a vase. If people brought flowers to the house, we'd have to plant them in the garden. Thank you for the flowers. Next time, could you bring food? He once spotted a photograph in a bar that he liked. I called the bar the next day to see if the photograph was for sale. It was a black and white A4 print that could be purchased for £250. I was shocked. The lady explained it was a limited edition print. I hadn't heard this phrase before and thought for £250 I could take a lot of my own photos and choose what's in them. I told him the whole story thinking he'd find it sweet and funny. He looked sad and said, why didn't you just buy it? I understand now that he just needed some kind of gesture that meant that I loved him. Jealousy was also a problem. I had an old photo album in a cupboard featuring photos of my first boyfriend and a couple of other boys I'd seen more casually before we met. He needed me to throw the old photos away. Why did I need them? He suddenly had no respect for limited edition prints. I threw the photographs away. His need for them to be gone was greater than my need for them to be kept. He coped with his jealousy by unconsciously lowering my self-esteem. I don't think he bullied me, although I'd never really been bullied, apart from at Nickelodeon, by a puppet who was supposed to be a bit snarky, which would have been fine if when we finished shooting he hadn't said to me, I meant that. Eventually I realised I was giving the puppet his power by believing he existed, and began to stop making eye contact with an insecure man's arm. There wasn't much bullying at my school. There was a guy who arrived in the sixth form with a very large penis that he would chase people with. <laughs> and that was a terrifying time. And looking back, I imagine it was the largest penis in the school because nobody ever challenged it with their own penis. <laughs> Even the teacher said, there's nothing we can do. It's... <laughs> One day we were looking for a restaurant and I suggested Cafe M. He looked suspicious and asked, how do you know about Cafe M? 
I'd been on a couple of dates there, but I couldn't say that because my past was now in a bin. A few weeks later at a New Year's Eve party, someone came up to us who I didn't recognise at first. I said, how do I know you? He said, we had a date at Cafe M. I just stood there and smiled. It was so out of my control, it didn't feel real. I felt like I was stuck in a play where I'd just have to wait for my boyfriend to say his furious lines so I could respond with my passive lines and then watch him storm off stage. Then the curtains would come down. Surely, please, who's in charge of the curtains? I followed him out of the party. He was screaming at me, but it was New Year's Eve and there were fireworks going off so I couldn't hear anything he said. It felt incredibly cinematic, so I imagined the play had been turned into a film and I waited a long time for the credits. It all, it all just seemed to happen so quickly and I went to my mum for some advice, but her advice is only ever practical. There's no emotional advice from my mother, only practical. There's a bit of background. All the furniture in this flat was his. When I went to my mum and said, I just don't know who I am anymore in this relationship. I just can't. I, d- I think I've got to end this relationship. She said, well, you can't split up with him. He'll have nowhere to sit. <laughs> I stayed with him for another two months, during which I met a psychotherapist in an event I was asked to host. When I wasn't on stage introducing people, I said, I know you can't tell me what to do, but I'm in a relationship and I'm really stressed. What should I do? She said, you should leave him. I said, oh, yeah, you don't need that in your life. What do you need that for? She gave me what felt like official medical permission to leave. However, the question then became, how do I leave? I still felt like it should work. We were just two human beings in a flat in Hampstead. If this couldn't work, what hope was there for the Middle East? I was eventually told by another psychotherapist that this was silly and finally felt able to end it. My boyfriend and I woke up together. He asked if I was going to have breakfast with him. I said I was okay. I stayed in the bed until he was in the shower. I sat on the sofa in my pyjamas until he eventually walked into the living room. I said, I don't think we're making each other happy. He said, I knew this was coming and agreed. He was calm. I was free. But then I went to New York and he was angry. How could I go to New York in the middle of this breakup? For me, it felt like a good time. He thought the relationship hadn't meant anything to me, that he was just some guy who had stuck around. As part of the breakup, he said he needed some money to move out. I think he just wanted some proof that the relationship had actually happened. And if he couldn't make me love him, maybe he could make me hate him. But he couldn't crack me. No matter how insane and upsetting the situation became, I remained a detached, highly compassionate psychopath. I was in Edinburgh doing a show that was partly about him. I was terrified a reviewer would quote one of the lines. I could have dropped the jokes, but jokes are not easy to come by, and the show was already too short. We were both seeing therapists in order to make the breakup less traumatic. Unfortunately, therapists tend to side with the person they're treating, and it became more traumatic. This was until my therapist told me about the drama triangle and the winning circle. I called my ex from my bedroom in Edinburgh with a diagram in front of me, featuring a triangle and a circle, along with the key sentence, I'm okay, you're okay. We spoke in a vulnerable, assertive and caring way. These were words from the winning circle, about how we'd both ended up being one or more of the following things on the drama triangle. Victim, rescuer, aggressor. What followed was the most intense meta-conversation I've ever been involved in. When he was aggressive, I asked him if he could transition to assertive, And I was able to do this because I was allowing myself to be vulnerable enough to say things like, when you talk to me like that, it scares me. Thanks to our time in the winning circle, we were finally able to speak to each other. I was now just angry with myself for letting it all happen. I was also too scared to be anything but vague in my next show about the lesson I was finally able to receive. And then I got in this mini cab and started telling the cab driver about it. He said to me, well, is there anything you can do about this, Bill? And I said... No, there's nothing I can do. It's a real injustice. And he said, acceptance. (laughs) What do you mean, whispering wise cab driver? (laughs) And he explained so absurdly simply that if there's nothing you can do about something, then you do nothing. And in that moment, the feeling of injustice, the frustration, it was lifted, it was gone. There was nothing to do. Even after the breakup, I would see him at the odd party and feel scared that he'd disapprove of who I was with or what I was doing with my life. I remember going into a panic while cutting up a melon in someone's kitchen. He walked in and I said, Hi, do you want some melon? Look at this melon. He didn't want any melon. I kept going, Have some melon, delicious melon. Why wouldn't you want the melon? He said, Because you're not really offering me a melon, are you? He could always spot when I was using fruit as a defence mechanism. Half an hour later, my cousin called me. I went outside because I knew it could be bad news. He told me my grandma was dying. I stood in the street feeling something much deeper and less familiar than anxiety. I went back into the house to get my coat. The atmosphere at the party felt suddenly insane. 
Someone tried to talk to me and possibly for the first time that I can remember, I didn't start performing. I saw my ex-boyfriend on a sofa near the door and sat next to him. I said, hi, I'm about to go. I want you to know that the relationship we had meant a lot to me. It wasn't nothing. So thank you. And then I got up and left. Chapter 3 Me, but better At 27, despite having become everything my 13-year-old self wanted to be, that relationship, along with an obsession with the self being an illusion, meant that I wasn't very impressed. If I was funny, it was the writing and editing. If I was attractive, it was the fame and lighting. I suppose the real problem is, we're not significant, are we? I learned how to be myself by being on stage, but to be on stage, you have to believe that you're special. The Buddhist principle of no self therefore causes problems. I was safe if I was special, but I couldn't be special if I wasn't a self. Who was I? Who? Who? This is the kind of question you can spend a lot of time with if you live alone and don't have a job. I really thought the cat would end my loneliness. It has only become a mascot for my loneliness. <laughs> so if anyone does come round, they go, oh, you've got a cat, you're quite lonely. <laughs> What's he called? Solitude. <laughs> What I realised, having been in this relationship, was how much of my time had been spent with him. And now, I didn't have quite enough friends. I think I've got three, but one I'm not that keen on. <laughs> and I've got 150 names in my phone, but these are not the names of people who I would normally phone and say, hey, let's have a lunch today. These people's names are only in my phone so that when they call, I don't answer. <laughs> you just have to make plans. That's the key, especially if you don't have a normal job, because if you live alone, and you don't make plans, here is what happens. You wake up, and it just gets darker. <laughs> I caught myself a few weeks ago, clutching my cat to my chest, saying, we're all right, aren't we? <laughs> There's no one there taking care of me. There are no rules. I'm now watching the least ethical porn and... <laughs> I don't even know how it happened. I used to say to people, and it was true, I can watch pornography as long as the people in it are clearly smiling and enjoying what they're doing. That is not the case anymore. <laughs> I'm now rarely watching anything unless there is a person in it who has been tricked. <laughs> And everything in my fridge is fair trade and organic. The porn is neither. <laughs> just have to make plans. That's the key. You just have to make plans so that life has the illusion of meaning and forward momentum. And that's why you're here. So you've done something tonight. Because people tomorrow will ask you, what did you do last night? And then you can say, I went to a live taping at the BBC because I live in London. I'm alive. I'm alive. <laughs> Are you, though? Or are you just desperately filling the time so you don't have to feel all the pain? <laughs> well, you came to the wrong show. <laughs> all this loneliness and despair may have been fine if I hadn't been so absurdly sober. Two years earlier, I'd visited Thailand, felt a great sense of calm and read a book on Buddhism called Taming the Monkey Mind. I didn't think I had the time to become a Buddhist, but not eating other animals or drinking alcohol seemed like a good idea. Alcohol had never been something I liked the taste of anyway, and I always assumed everyone else was just pretending. I know this because when I was 16 and alcohol was first introduced to my group of friends, I ended up saying, this is ridiculous, we're children. <laughs> and then because I couldn't cope with what was going on, I would pretend to be asleep on a sofa, thinking I can't wait till I'm 17 so I can drive away from this fun. <laughs> And I don't drink now, and I understand the reason we drink in this culture. It creates a fluidity, it means we can sort of cope with the people we love. But if you, <laughs> if you don't have that, then you need other coping mechanisms. So what I've noticed is that I tend to say the word fun a lot at parties. Oh, this is fun, it's a fun party. You having fun? I'm having fun. What a fun party. You a couple? How, how long have you been together? How did you get the spark alive in your relationship? And then they feel awkward, and I can relax. <laughs> But being sober and underneath everything still quite shy meant that meeting new people became quite tricky. It was because I would see somebody at a party that I really liked and I'd, I'd think, gosh, 
well, he seems just about perfect. Like, who knows what could happen? I could end up spending the rest of my life with him. And what I would do every time to woo him, to pursue him, to make him see that I was the one for him, is I would go home and hope that I saw him again. <laughs> so I couldn't talk to people. I couldn't talk to people. And then I saw the film Waking Life. I don't know if you've seen it, but one line stood out for me. Actual self-awareness is the knowledge that you are a character in someone else's dream. I love this idea that it could all be a dream, and it's somebody else's dream. It makes everything so silly. There's no need to fear anything, no need to feel anxious about anything. It's all a dream. And if you're playing a character, and that character isn't serving you, that shy, anxious character who can't talk to people, let go of the character. Become a different character. I was out with a friend of mine walking through the streets of North London on a Sunday afternoon a few months ago. And in the time that we were together, he got the phone numbers of about four different girls. His thing is he's able to go up to girls and say, hello, what's your name? They exchange phone numbers, and then later, they have sex. <laughs> That's a better system than mine. <laughs> I said, you've got to do this for me. He then spots this guy that I've been looking at, and before I can run away scared of what might occur, he just saunters up to this guy and says, hello, young man. <laughs> you look like a fun chap. What are you up to today in your life? And this young student guy says, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm meeting some friends in the park. And my friend says, well, we must join you. <laughs> <laughs> and for some reason, this guy doesn't say, why? <laughs> I think it's because my friend said, we must. And so he just went, oh, well, if you're in charge of the world, okay. <laughs> We're now sat in this park with these people and everyone's acting very nonchalant, like it's a normal thing to have happened. But at least in my head, I'm screaming, but we're all strangers. <laughs> I try to chat up the one that I like. I say, you look like the cool one in the group. <laughs> because I don't know how to talk to humans. <laughs> so my friend then rescues me <laughs> from my character and says, why don't you two exchange phone numbers now? We must move on with our lives. <laughs> so we do exchange phone numbers because he's told us to. <laughs> Generally in life, we feel we're in control, but we're just like ants wandering around, hoping to avoid bumping into each other, as humans hoping to avoid doing anything that might embarrass us. And this was a moment without any fear. We're not in control of our lives. You're not in control of your lives. I'm aware that half of the people in here are only in here because the person next to you likes me. <laughs> yeah. Maybe more than half, maybe. <laughs> And I'm not, in, I'm not in control of my life, even being here tonight. It's just that something happened in my childhood where there was a moment of fear. I responded with something funny and that worked. So I carried on with that. And now I'm here talking to you into a microphone. Which I don't need. <laughs> just because it gives the impression that I'm definitely a stand-up comedian. Otherwise, I'm just a man standing. <laughs> So I asked my friend, I said, what do you want me to do now? Should I text him next week and see what he's up to? He said, no, you don't, just text him now and see what he's doing tonight. I said, this is a bit keen, we just walked away. Shouldn't I play hard to get a bit? He said, no, you don't play hard to get, you just pick someone up in a park. <laughs> and he was right, this stupid game based on fear that we play this hard to get game. We don't play it in any other area of our lives. If you're in a supermarket and you think, oh, I got fancy potato. You don't go, oh, I'd better avoid eye contact. <laughs> You grab the potato, you bloody eat it. The only difference between a potato and a human being is there's a fear of rejection. That's not the only difference. Um, <laughs> everything is a choice between fear and love. We may as well choose love because death is coming. <laughs> death is coming. <laughs> death is coming. <laughs> That's my catchphrase. <laughs> so I texted him there and then because death is coming. And he was free that night. 
He was free that night. We were then going on this date that night. We'd met that day. We're going on this date that night. I feel alive. I feel like I'm living some sort of dream-like existence. My friend then gives me tips on how to have sex with him that evening because that is what this is about. His tips were, don't talk about the past. Don't discuss the future. This is just about this moment. Just keep saying the words spontaneous and adventure. Spontaneous adventure. Aren't we spontaneous? What an adventure we've been on today. We met today and we spontaneously decided to be here right now. What an adventure it has been. What an adventure it could continue to be. Aren't you spontaneous? Aren't I spontaneous? When was the last time you did something spontaneous? We're so adventurous. What an adventure this is. It worked. <laughs> he taught me two things that day. One, some confidence, because why be timid? Death is coming. And two, <laughs> hypnosis. <laughs> I learned to say yes to a moment, that there was a way out of my personality. This is also one of the key rules of improv. You mustn't block. You have to say yes and. So if there are two actors in a scene and one of them says, Miriam, what are you doing in the castle? You mustn't say, this isn't a castle. Who is Miriam? However, when I wasn't with my magical friend, I struggled to make anything happen. And although I desperately needed love, self-hate refused to help me find it. Loneliness and low self-esteem brought me two gifts. I met an actor so talented I became incredibly sad that I was a comedian and a young playwright who invited me to such cool parties I forgot I was funny. The Cool People I didn't know how disconnected I had become until I was invited to a series of very cool parties last year by some cool people. They took drugs though, and I don't take drugs, so that was a bit awkward to see happening in front of me, like these lines of cocaine being racked up on a coffee table and to be offered a line and not know what to say, so end up saying, oh, no, thank you, I've just eaten, you carry on. <laughs> when I was at school, they showed us a video of a girl who took ecstasy and died. So I thought, I won't do that then, because I've got plans. I wasn't cool enough to be at these parties. I was on TV, which meant I had status, but I felt like I shouldn't really have been allowed in. I hadn't written a play or trained at RADA. I was an anxious TV presenter whose only arts qualification was a certificate in preparatory tap. To describe the people at these parties, there was a guy there called Merlin, and that is not the issue. <laughs> I noticed one night he had the most incredible straight white teeth and I said to him, gosh Merlin, you've got such perfect teeth, did you wear a brace as a child? No, that's the sort of person that was there. <laughs> they just grew out of his gums without anxiety. <laughs> I don't know why there's still so much anxiety in my life. The other day, a guy approached me, and I wasn't sure if I'd met him before or not, and in the panic of the moment, I just said, I've got that jumper. <laughs> and I didn't. I'm aware that the anxieties in this book are those of someone whose primary needs have been met, but all feelings are valid. Many years ago, a therapist told me, if you lost a leg and the person next door lost two legs, you would still have lost a leg. I wonder what was going on on this street and thought it would be best to move if you could. There was a lot of talk of Jasper at these parties. You must meet Jasper, Simon. You'd love beautiful Jasper. He's in Paris at the moment, but when you meet him, oh my God, Jasper arrived six months later and I don't really find him attractive. But I, I don't feel I should reject the idea because I've already said no to so much cocaine and I want to be a guy <laughs> who's at the party. There, one of them. I don't want to be a guy in the corner secretly making notes for a show. So... <laughs> stuck with my personality which ended up saying maybe we should kiss he then stands up and says I might get a drink actually <laughs> leaving me thinking I didn't even want him but he just got back from Paris that's not a reason to go for someone otherwise I should be sort of the London terminal of the Eurostar <laughs> <Not sure. laughs> oh Brussels continue to do one I couldn't connect with the people there. I couldn't connect with Jasper. I found out recently he now works for a magazine that comes out twice a year. 
I mean, why not be really interesting and work for a magazine that doesn't come out? <laughs> Have you read Toot? No, no one has. It's too cool for eyes. <laughs> There was a hot tub in the garden where all kinds of things went on. It eventually broke because it was apparently clogged with sin. I would always go home before anything like this could happen. And even if I stayed late enough, I don't think I would have had the confidence to take off all my clothes and jump into a hot tub of sin. The people there were comfortable in their bodies. There were men wearing vests. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and I, every three to four years, find myself buying a vest, thinking, maybe this time. <laughs> I hated my body when I was a teenager and then got to about 25 and it suddenly became quite trendy to be skinny. And I got a bit carried away and ended up saying at a party, I'm quite skinny. And the girl said, you're not that skinny. And then I was fat. <laughs> I may have developed an eating disorder around this time. I've never deliberately thrown up food, but I did occasionally try too hard to poo. Is that an eating disorder? Is it an eating disorder if it includes poking a finger in to get things going? It's not classic bulimia. I'm not sure if that paragraph was worth the truth. The other issue, and this is often a problem when I meet new people, they somehow don't realize that I am funny. <laughs> I was in East London's Shoreditch recently, and I was drawn on this particular night to this guy wearing very large, round, funny, big glasses. Really funny, crazy, oversized, big, round glasses. And I said to him, hi, they're big glasses. And he said, not really. <laughs> Small face? <laughs> he said, I'm short-sighted. I said, oh, I know, look, we're all short-sighted, but if you can't see how big they are, <laughs> maybe you need bigger glasses. Everything I thought about the people at these parties was a nonsense. They were as young and insecure as I was. In fact, they were younger and possibly more insecure. To cover their anxieties, they had alcohol and drugs, while I had my personality, which couldn't quite find a way to be funny around these people, so I remained stuck at quiet and sad. At one party, we were all stood in the garden watching Chinese paper lanterns floating into the sky. I saw these young, beautiful people cheering and hugging each other and thought, everyone here is going to age and die. The actor. I did fall in love about five years ago. Fell in love five years ago, but with somebody I invented, which isn't ideal. <laughs> and... Uh, he was based on somebody who existed, but because I, I had such low self-esteem, I took every negative attribute I felt about myself, converted those into positive attributes, and projected those onto him. Thus, he would heal me and complete me in my life. Initially, I just liked him because he was really thin. I really liked that. Like, thinner than me, ill thin. <laughs> I don't know why I like that. I just like the idea I could go on a date with someone, and it could be their last date. <laughs> A lot of it is narcissism, really. My, I realised my type is me, but better. <laughs> Which I think is OK, I just need to find somebody who wants himself, but much, much worse. <laughs> I went to see him in this play that he was in, and he was really vulnerable on stage, and weeks had been building up to this moment, and all I could manage when I saw him at the party was a kind of polite nod, and I don't know if he saw it, he didn't nod back, and then I felt awkward about approaching him at all, and an hour went past and I couldn't approach him, and then I saw him leave, I saw him leave the theater, his rucksack on his back, his little beanie hat on his head, and as he got further and further away, it became harder and harder to move, and he was gone, gone. Three weeks go by of sadness, pain, regret, I've turned him into the only person I can possibly be with in my life. <laughs> a lot of it was ego. I just felt like he was going to become a great actor. And he could make people cry, and I could become a great comedian and make people laugh. And if we were together, <laughs> we could be like a, a two-man Robin Williams. <laughs> All the talent 
of Robin Williams, but in two separate thin men. <laughs> I didn't know how I was going to meet him again. And then I was in a shop in Covent Garden that sells vintage clothing. And he was there in the shop. I felt in that moment that God had brought us together. I don't feel that now so much because it, it feels like the thought of a deluded moron. I'm not an atheist. Like, I'm a big fan of Jesus Christ. There's nobody more thin or vulnerable than Jesus Christ. <laughs> That actor was in that shop at the same time as me. And I don't believe in coincidence. I think coincidence is a word we invented for something that we don't quite understand yet. I read a book called Illusions, Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah. On the cover of this book is a blue feather because the character slash author of this book believes in the philosophy, thinking makes it so. We create our own reality. He tests this by visualising a blue feather in his fingers. He believes, like Buddhists, that everything has already been achieved. Time is an illusion. So if he feels he has the blue feather already, it will come to him because there's nothing opposing that idea. Later in the book, the blue feather appears. I test this myself with a white feather. I felt I had the white feather in my fingers. Not that I needed the white feather or desired the white feather. It had already been achieved. Later, I was at a picnic. I put my hand in a packet of crisps, which is something I wouldn't normally do. <laughs> I pulled out a crisp with a white feather on, which is disgusting. <laughs> but there he was in the shop. And I don't know how you feel. Maybe you think, well, he walked into that shop at the same time as you with his own legs. No, I put him in that shop with my God mind. Now, some people will say, well, you know, if we do create our own reality, what about the Holocaust? What about victims of child abuse? Do they create that in their worlds? And the thing you have to understand about that is... Shh. <laughs> in my ideal world, I would have been able to go up to him and just say, hey, how are you? I saw your play the other week. It was great. Oh, thank you. Oh, of course. I, I, I remember the nod. <laughs> Why are you crying? <laughs> I've got too many sinks. <laughs> Here's what actually happened. <laughs> Because of my personality, I saw him there, he hadn't seen me yet. It was about a metre away from me, there, that thin. <laughs> and what I thought, for some reason, what I thought would be really cool and seductive would be to just stand in the middle of the shop and shout his full name. <laughs> He turned round, alarmed. I could see the terror in his eyes, but because I'd started at a certain volume, I thought it'd be too odd to get any quieter. <laughs> so I'm then just shouting at him about the good reviews that this player's had, and he's going, oh, I don't really read reviews, and he's all timid and vulnerable, which is why I love him. <laughs> and I think the difference between us, because I think we were both quite shy as children. I say I think I did a lot of research on him. <laughs> But he retained that shyness and it makes him beautiful and sensitive. And I decided shyness was something to be overcome. And I think it's in our training. He went to a really good acting school in London where he was taught to nourish his sensitivity, to nurture his vulnerability. And that's what makes him a great actor. I went to a Saturday morning stage school in Essex <laughs> where we were taught that whether we were singing, dancing or acting, just do it loud. <laughs> so I didn't become good at any of those things. But when I danced, people heard. <laughs> but now I was in London talking to this actor and I suggested this wonderful avant-garde club on a Monday night, which he hadn't heard of, which meant that I could say, well, I'll email you the details, that casual. He said, okay. I then had his email address. He gave me his email address. I went home and I composed the most beautiful funny little email. Six friends confirmed it was a beautiful, funny email. 
I pressed send, and this is very much the end of this story. He never emailed back. <laughs> All this self-hate led me to think that if I couldn't have the actor, I would have to become him. I began to take acting lessons, went to see many plays, not all of them starring him, and co-wrote a BBC Two sitcom called Grandma's House, in which I played a disillusioned TV presenter seeking a more meaningful life as an actor, as well as the love of a semi-fictional actor. At the same time, I continued to stalk the actor, just in case he changed his mind. A friend of mine was in a play upstairs at the Royal Court, and he was in the play downstairs, or it could have been the other way round. Downstairs is the bigger space, but as an actor of such integrity, he would have been drawn to the material rather than the size of the room. I remember exactly what I wore the first time we met again. I went for clothes that I thought he would have worn. A thin green jumper over a lightweight shirt with grey trousers. My hair had never looked so curly or delicious, and knowing that I couldn't possibly look any better than I did made his indifference quite tricky to accept. When both plays were finished, I spotted him in the bar and found the courage to ask him how the play had gone and if he wanted to find somewhere to sit. We found a quiet corner, and I then spent the next hour trying to appear to be the most calm, sensitive and connected version of myself that anyone had ever experienced. I was not in any way funny. I didn't know how to be. I couldn't tease him about anything because I thought he was perfect. How do you make an angel laugh? So I spent all my energy trying to appear as pure and mysterious as him. I thought if I could do a really good impression of him, then surely he would like me. Hearing this now, I realised he could have had his own self-esteem issues and therefore found meeting himself quite upsetting. I asked him, as someone so good at acting, if he could give me some acting advice, which was an odd combination of intense flirting and genuine need for advice. How does acting work? I don't know, he said. It's just sort of magic, which I found incredibly appealing and totally useless. I should have remembered what my mum used to say about how you can be or do anything you want in this life because everyone you see on TV or on film, they all shit. <laughs> she used to say that a lot. She would point at the television and say, shit comes out of them. You'll be a star. Maybe it's difficult not to have low self-esteem if you're born in a kingdom. I wrote this next bit of stand-up as a way of expressing how ridiculous I think it is that we still have a monarchy, but I think it's really about me feeling like a peasant. In this country, we have a queen. And not in the past. <laughs> to me, what's amazing about her is she doesn't seem to be embarrassed. She walks into rooms, there are trumpets. <laughs> if that was me, I'd say, oh no, you mustn't, it's ridiculous. <laughs> but she stands there and she thinks, yes, this is appropriate. <laughs> and then people sing, God save the queen, like she's more important than them. If there's going to be a song that we all sing, it should be something like, we're all the same thing. Blood comes out of us all, and shit, and phlegm, and sexual fluids, and snot. And somebody would have to write it, but that sort of thing. <laughs> People love her. People love the Queen. I think I preferred it when we thought she'd murdered Diana. <laughs> But really my concern is for her, because she is just a person. She's a person, so there must be so much denial in her life. She must wake up every morning, do a shit, and then for the rest of the day, have to pretend that that did not happen. <laughs> because if she's just a person who does a shit, those trumpets are going to start to sound sarcastic. <laughs> Meanwhile, the lady teaching me to act must have become quite frustrated by how defended I was. I refused to let her in, even though I was paying for the sessions and desperate to be broken down, to be present, to be able to feel something real. She suggested I spend a month at Philippe Gaulier's clown school in Paris so I could let go of my inhibitions and free my vulnerable inner clown. On the first day, Gaulier asked us all to stand up, say our names and what we did for a living. I thought, well, this is going to go quite well. I'll say I'm Simon, I'm a stand-up comedian, and he'll say, how wonderful, we have a professional in the room. Instead, he said, So you say a funny thing and everybody thinks it is so funny that you said something funny. There is nothing more disgusting than stand-up comedy. Once the introductions were complete, we spent the whole month performing in exercises designed to strip away context so that we were forced to be funny in some pure childlike way. 
A performer has to have some vulnerability and joy or they stink. Gullier had a drum, and every time he thought someone was being too boring or disgusting, he'd bang it and then take a vote on whether anyone would mind if the person on stage was eaten by a shark. In one exercise, I was paired up with an Australian girl called Tessa. Gullier said, here is the scene. You are circus performers and the lions have eaten the lion tamer, so there is no lion show today. You have to fill for 20 minutes. I wasn't sure what to do, but Tessa started saying, Ah, I'm a lion. I froze. All I could think was, Tessa is not a lion. So I decided to ignore her and announced, Ladies and gentlemen, the lions are not available. Golia banged his drum. He said, no talking. And I didn't know what else I could do. Tessa carried on being a lion and I couldn't join in. Golia banged his drum again and said, Tessa, I want you to hit Simon until he is funny. I thought, okay, at least this is a new scene with some context. Tessa will do some play fighting and I'll be able to respond in some funny way. But she hit me hard. I screamed in pain and everyone laughed. I thought, I'm in a lot of pain, but my vulnerability is getting laughs. And then Gollier banged his drum and said, very good. But Simon, you know these laughs are not for you. They are for Tessa's joy in hitting you. A few years later, a week after the first series of Grandma's House was broadcast on BBC Two, I spotted the actor who I'd based one of the characters on standing outside Sadler's Wells Theatre. Instant terror and excitement. Apparently we'd both booked tickets for the same contemporary dance show on the same night, and yet somehow still weren't living together discussing art. I thought I would casually go up to him and try to bring up the sitcom in a way that suggested I was clearly over him, but had used all these ridiculous former feelings to create something beautiful. I wondered how he'd feel about me now. He hadn't been that fussed about me as a TV presenter, but now I was a proper comedian, a sort of actor, and a writer who had written things about him. I approached cautiously and said hello in a way that suggested I was someone completely at peace with himself. He said hello in a way that was hard to read. I said, I think I should maybe apologise to you. He said with genuine sensitivity and concern, oh, what for? I replied, I sort of fictionalised you in something that was just on TV. He looked a bit confused and then said, oh, I think I heard about that. He'd heard about it. He hadn't watched it. I thought, what do I have to do to get your fucking attention? I actually felt quite good that evening. I was on a date with someone I was really falling for. And as we watched the show, I was incredibly happy to be with him, perhaps even happier than I would have been with this ethereal actor person. Six months later, that relationship ended and he went on to write a beautiful album. I listened to it thinking, I imagine a few of these songs will be about me. None of them. You mustn't date a singer-songwriter. Date a plumber. Then you don't know who they're dedicating their piping to. I want someone to write about me. Why can't someone else write a book connecting all these bits of stand-up and deconstruct who I am? So undignified to be sat here doing it myself. Maybe the worst moment was seeing a photograph of my ex online being hugged by the actor who had also rejected me. I put my hands over my face. I wasn't in the picture. I was sat in my flat alone and there was no way either of them were saying, how's Simon? A year later, the actor was in another play at the Royal Court. So I thought I'd give myself one more go at making him love me. I felt I'd written and performed all the insanity out of my head and was now ready for something real. I believed this because it would have been unbearable to accept that after all that transformative, healing comedy, I was still the same lunatic. I found him in the bar and we got talking again. I felt more relaxed than I ever had with him, and I wasn't pretending this time, I was actually relaxed. Though I was also very impressed with how relaxed I was, so I can't have been that relaxed. We must have been sat talking for around an hour, and it was actually a really grounded, relationship-building conversation. The only moment of panic came when he told me that he'd seen a photo of me as a little boy somewhere, which he thought could have been him. The sudden lack of distance between us was too much for me. I started ranting about what a brilliant, sensitive child he must have been and what a stage school maniac I was. He offered me a moment of connection and I couldn't receive it. And then he revealed he was very happy with a boyfriend. A composer. I thought, OK, Simon, we tried our best. He's happy. It's enough now. He's with a composer. We can't beat that. Can he juggle? He also told me he couldn't email me back all those years ago for reasons more complicated and personal than anything to do with me being less brilliant than him. He hadn't rejected me. I put on my coat, we hugged goodbye, and I went to the toilet feeling relieved that it was over. As I walked out of the toilet feeling a real sense of completion, he walked in, which I wasn't expecting. We'd had our hug goodbye, and I didn't know what else to say, so I said, Composer, huh? Chapter 4 Fear of normal. You end up with a partner, you end up with a mortgage, you end up with a family. So now when people say to me, oh, we're having a baby, I have to say, oh, really? Do you know who else had a baby? Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> a 
and they think they're so significant because they've created life. All they've done is continue the cycle of misery unnecessarily. And surely it's the least ethical thing you can do at this time of climate change. We are running out of oil. I read that we're running out of water. We're running out of water and people are bringing more people into the world when we're running out of water. Next time somebody announces to you the happy news that she's pregnant, spit in her face. <laughs> I grew up surrounded by a lot of casually racist, sexist nonsense. My family's general intolerance was quite normal, and my anger towards them alerted me to the fact that I wasn't. I'd watch Oprah, where people who said offensive things were booed. I didn't understand how people in Gantz Hill were getting away with it, but it seemed to be because they were not in front of a studio audience. It confirmed to me that I would only be safe if I got into the television. Years later, having achieved this, I had a minor meltdown on live radio, which, having thought about it, was possibly about my safe space, show business, a place of endless joy and freedom, suddenly seeming unbearably dull and possibly racist. I was being interviewed on the Radio 1 breakfast show on the morning that Nelson Mandela had died. <laughs> which, of course, was very sad and shocking news, even though he was 95. <laughs> and human... The producer came and told me the news and asked if I wouldn't make any jokes about it. Which really upset me, because I'm not an insensitive lunatic, I'm a brilliant, vulnerable clown. <laughs> I thought, okay, I don't want to cause any problems for these people. So I'm on the way to the Radio 1 studio and I walk past One Extra, their urban station, which I see is black people in a booth. That's not their jingle, but it's... <laughs> It's my observation in that moment. I then get to the Radio 1 studio, which is exclusively white people in a booth. Nelson Mandela has died. Black people in one booth. White people in separate, nicer booths. And I think, don't mention that. But before the interview begins, the host, who's a very sweet guy, tells me that he hasn't read any questions for the interview, which makes me feel very anxious, and then he opens with a story about a cheese sandwich that he has eaten. And not even that morning. <laughs> and I get why he's doing that, it's so that he can give the impression that we're both likeable, normal guys. But that is not what I am. <laughs> If I'm going to be on the radio being interviewed, I want people listening to be able to be saying, oh, oh, we, shh, shh, we must listen for the wisdom. <laughs> Especially on a morning where people are looking for a new spiritual leader. <laughs> I'm desperately searching for something funny or inspiring or original to say. And then I hear him say BBC. And beyond my control, I say, what's going on at the BBC? There are a lot of white people in here. And I think, oh, I haven't made my point very clearly. <laughs> so I say, well, next door in a separate booth, there are only black people. I don't think Mandela would approve. <laughs> Which causes some tension. The host then is forced to apologise to anyone who found what I said offensive. I say, but it wasn't offensive, which really upset them. And, and they're being told off by a producer. And it's so awkward, it's so rare that anyone tells me off these days because I'm such a delight. <laughs> and I, I, I don't even know what to say, I don't know how to defend what I've said. It's not like, like I don't even know what Mandela would have thought. He was alive when One Extra was created. He didn't do anything about it then. I really needed laughter in that moment. Laughter would have meant everything was okay. But what I said wasn't actually properly funny. I just panicked. And the BBC on the morning of Mandela's death was not a safe space to be almost funny. And I visited this school, teachers children who are autistic, and I said to the head teacher, I don't really know anything, but it seems to me that the child who is autistic doesn't have autism. What they have is a kind of freedom from all the conventions and the nonsense that we have to put up with. And if there's any stress or anxiety that they feel, isn't that often from us trying to make them the same as everyone else? And she said, well, that's a nice idea. <laughs> but sometimes they want to masturbate in public. <laughs> And I think that story is 
really about me. <laughs> it was really interesting seeing the social conventions that the children who are autistic are taught because they have no interest in them, they have no instinct for them. And so I went to shake this kid's hand, and as I was shaking his hand, I could see him thinking, this is bullshit, isn't it? <laughs> I was in a class of very young kids being taught to spread jam on toast. And it's not that they can't do that, they just really have no, in they're just not interested, they're just looking around thinking, what, what, what why? This is just wasting valuable masturbation time. <laughs> As I was leaving, I walked through the playground and uh, this very sweet looking 10 year old boy came towards me. I thought he'd say hello and he said prick and carried on walking. <laughs> and I felt so connected. <laughs> Because it's so, you know, what we have in this culture as appropriate or inappropriate language is so absurd anyway that to call somebody an asshole is a bad thing to call them. If we didn't have assholes, we would explode. <laughs> to say to someone you're an asshole, it's like saying you're a vital member of this community. <laughs> when the word cocksucker became such an insult. If there were no cocksuckers, who would suck all the cocks? <laughs> How could the worst thing you can call someone be cunt? It is where we all come from. To say to someone you're a cunt is like saying you're the doorway to life. <laughs> A few years ago, in an airport on the way home from a comedy festival, I was feeling incredibly free and funny when I had something similar to the kind of anxiety attack someone who is autistic may have if something doesn't go exactly how they feel it should. But then I was at the Dublin airport coming home from a comedy festival with a couple of friends. And one of these friends sees this girl that he finds attractive working at the Mac makeup counter. So I say, well, let's go over and say hello to this woman because we're alive. And... <laughs> That's something I say occasionally. <laughs> and uh, I think it's been my idea, so I should host the flirting. So I say, hello, what's all this? <laughs> she tells us about the exciting new Mac range, and I, in order to get my friend involved with her, in a sort of flirty, silly way, ask, what would you recommend for my friend with his nice pale skin? What would you recommend for him? She says, well, your girlfriend. I said, no, no, there's no girlfriend. He's very much single. What would you recommend for him? She says, well, if you had a girlfriend. I said, no, there's no girlfriend. What would you recommend for him? She says, well, women. And then, and I didn't even know why, I was warm from fury. <laughs> We all combine the male and the female. It still upsets me to hear even young, trendy couples saying things like, we're having a baby, but we don't know the gender, so we, we don't know whether to paint the nursery blue or pink. We might go for yellow, just to be safe. What is the danger here? Go blue, go nuts. What if it's a girl? We don't want to grow up to be Bruce Willis. <laughs> I start saying things like, what if Eddie Izzard walked up? This is very limiting, isn't it? She didn't know who he was, which annoyed me. <laughs> She was beautiful, and she knew that she was beautiful, but I think that's all she knew. <laughs> and that's just jealousy, really. If you are naturally beautiful, that is all you need in this world. I used to get so excited by models at parties. All oh, models! There are models at this party! I've got to go and flirt with the models! Must have a model! I was recently at a party, there were two models stood in front of me, and I was all ready to go into action, and I just thought, Oh, fuck you! <laughs> Because what have they done? They've grown high. <laughs> I learned to juggle. <laughs> She's wearing a lot of makeup, but we can't judge her for that. She works at the makeup counter, the hours go by, she gets bored. These things can accumulate. <laughs> And that's, I think that's a problem quite specific to the makeup counter. I've never gone into a shoe shop and somebody is covered in shoes. <laughs> I was standing there in this airport with no self-consciousness about shouting at this stranger. People, I don't care that people are looking. My other friend comes over and says, is everything all right? And I say, no, we just want to buy some makeup. <laughs> but apparently we should just fuck off. 
And then I see my friend for the first time who's clearly thinking, well, this isn't quite what we planned. <laughs> the worry is that incidents like this could still happen. I occasionally feel incredibly threatened by the conventional. I went to a wedding recently that was just a little too white, heterosexual and Christian. And I had an intense feeling that if the Nazis came and took me away, the people at the wedding would feel sad, but not stop them. I can't believe people still get married. People with degrees. These people have usually lived together for 10 years. What is this wedding for? Two people who are already living together wish to announce they are to continue as they are. Why do I need to go to Dorset for that? A couple who are apparently already happy. Why not just stay in your house and shush? Send an email saying we've been together for 10 years, it's going well, carry on. It should be the single person sending out invitations saying, I'm so lonely, can we please have one day where I don't feel sad? What would be wrong with this conversation? I love you, I love you too. Should we put on a big event and tell everyone we know? Seems arrogant. You wouldn't get everyone together to announce we've made loads of money and we think it will last until death. A few years ago, a friend told me I'm marrying my girlfriend. It's just getting to that point where we either get married or split up. How can you either be about to stay together until one of you dies or never see each other again? We made it all up, marriage. It's not a naturally occurring thing. We had to have all this romantic language, will you marry me? Because it couldn't be the truth, which is, will you please save me from my loneliness, depression and fear? Because people would have said, I'm quite busy. <laughs> We shouldn't lie to each other, you know. I went to see the student play recently. There were these 19 or 20 year old students on stage. I was sat next to two 50 ish year old women. And one of them said to the other, Gosh, you're Timothy. He's turned out to be a real stud, hasn't he? And she said that in quite a light, jovial way. But I said what she was saying there was, I'd like to fuck your son. <laughs> I'm very impatient for this time that we live in and the things that are considered normal. People talk about the past, history, like that was all ridiculous. How could any of that have happened? I would like to be in the future now or somewhere else so I could look back at this time and say, do you remember when people drank milk from other species? <laughs> Did they see cows feeding their calves and think, yeah, that's probably for me. And do you remember when people felt proud of where they came from, like it was something to do with them? It's just what you happened to fall out of your mother's vagina. <laughs> oh, I'm so proud to be British. You may as well be proud to be caesarean. <laughs> With all these separate flags. If you're going to have a flag, have a flag of a vagina. <laughs> so then you can meet people and go, oh, hi, where are you from? Oh, same as me. Let's be friends. <laughs> How was peace finally achieved? The introduction of the vagina flag. <laughs> this fear of normal isn't just an abstract idea. I was circumcised by people who weren't even religious. The buffet wasn't kosher. Oh no, we don't care about that bit, we just love the cock cutting. We've had a boy, we have to cut off a bit of his penis, otherwise people will think we're weird parents. Around a year ago I was feeling a little lost and ended up at a retreat where a group of people led by a shaman took part in a series of sweat lodges a Native American ritual for resolving conflict within a warm womb-like teepee in Norfolk. The idea seemed to be to sweat and chant all the conflict out of you and then crawl out of the womb-like teepee, reborn. I experienced the first sweat lodge ceremony mainly as an observer. I didn't really understand what was going on or why it had to be so hot. In the second sweat lodge, a conflict of gender equality arose. The shaman had explained that women were not allowed in if they were on their moon period. This is what the shaman called a period. One of the women on this retreat, who was on her moon period, snuck in. And the shaman somehow knew. He began to provoke the women in the group, taking on a not-so-subtle chauvinist character, creating a lot of stress in what was already quite a hot teepee. I had a sense that this patriarchal dominance was what I would have experienced in the womb, and now felt I could maybe hold the key to resolving sexism. I don't understand how we can be sexist. I mean, apart from the fact there are so many women, you'd think it'd be rude. <laughs> But it's where we all come from. When do we begin to be sexist? Are we there in the womb thinking, well, this is all very well, but I think my dad will do a better job. <laughs> than this hysterical witch. <laughs> Women, you control the continuation of human existence. Until there is equality, you should stop breeding. 
Well, I suppose, I mean, have a baby if you want to have a baby. But if it's a boy, you must abort. <laughs> yes! Because it's a war! If you're a woman having sex with a man and creating more men, you should be hung for treason! <laughs> Do you think Winston Churchill would have got pregnant knowing there was a 50-50 chance he could have a Nazi? <laughs> Some of these are new thoughts. <laughs> In the first sweat lodge ceremony, I'd said something funny and felt very pleased to have got a big laugh, but then wondered why I was trying to get laughs in a sweat lodge. This time I found myself really wanting to speak, but embarrassed by the sincerity of it all. The tension between the men and women was by now unbearable. The men didn't know what to say about the moon period situation. Many of the women started talking about how they'd been treated in the past by men and the shaman's girlfriend started crying. Then my hands, followed by my entire body, began to vibrate. Something needed to come out of me. I finally said with total conviction, I would like to honour my mother for doing her best under difficult circumstances. That was all I planned to say, but then this rushed its way out of me. And I would like to honour my gay child self for doing the same. The shaman looked at me approvingly, like an older gay brother who understood my entire journey, or like a heterosexual shaman who'd been waiting for a gay baby to resolve the conflict. I felt strong, ready to be reborn, but I wanted to protect my child self before he was birthed into Essex. I thought about my mother, who would not be the powerful resource I would need to be in the conflicts that would follow. I knew I would find strong women in the television. I thought about Roseanne, Ruby Wax, French and Saunders, Oprah Winfrey, and then I covered myself in mud. Nobody else was doing this. I needed to have this baby protected, and now with my mud and my TV women, I crawled out of the womb and lay down on the grass. I burst into tears, and looking up at the men and women who'd come over to thank me for what I said, I thought, I did resolve sexism. What a brilliant baby. Chapter 5. Daddy. But we didn't talk for a while, and then he phoned me and said, I've been thinking, one day I'm going to be on my deathbed, and if we don't have a relationship, there will be regret. So now we make sure we see each other, like, once every couple of months, and I always regret it. (laughs) But when he dies, I'm going to feel pretty good. When I was 23, I went to my dad's second wedding, full of tightly repressed rage, only given expression by my wedding outfit. I wore a suit because it was a wedding, but I also went for a bright red t-shirt with the word anti printed on it, plus a necklace with a silver gun pendant, and a brooch that looks a bit like a swastika. Okay, dad, I'll come to your wedding, but only if I can come dressed as anger. When I was 25, my friend Kevin told me about something called the Landmark Forum, a three-day life-transforming course. Around 150 people in a room in Houston were encouraged by the leader to phone people who you've been blaming for everything in your lives. I phoned my father and said, Hi, I think I've been... I'm sorry for blaming you for the divorce that happened. I think I understand now that you're a fallible human being and not the evil monster that I made you out to be at the time. He said, I've been waiting 10 years to hear that. It felt like a real moment of healing. And then he said, What else did you learn at this course? Did they tell you it's possible the divorce made you gay? I said, we just sorted everything out. And then I thought, maybe I'm hanging on to this anger for my father so that I don't have to deal with any repressed rage I maybe have for my mother. <laughs> well, let's see how this goes in front of her. <laughs> because I've idealised my mother over the years. To me, she is the goody. But I had a memory of, uh, I guess in a moment of stress, her saying to me and my siblings, one day you'll come home from school and I'll be gone. (laughs) And I told her about this a while ago and she said, well, I don't remember that, but I was a single parent. I said, that's worse, one had already gone. (laughs) I called my mum during the course, unsure what to say to her, but certain I should call to resolve something. I said, I don't blame you for the divorce. And she said, of course you don't. It was your father's fault. She then told me that my dad wasn't very good during the pregnancy. A friend of hers called Mark took her to the zoo one day. He was apparently very sweet and kind to her. She thought about raising me with him instead. She said, I decided to stay with your father, but that's why your middle name is Mark. It's very important not to talk to your parents. 
I convinced my mum to come to the course to see if she'd sign up. She thought I'd joined a cult. My dad had no interest in attending. Mark would have come. He came over recently uh, in a week that I had been dumped by possibly the first person I've ever actually loved. And at the same time as that happening, my washing machine broke. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> so he comes over to fix the washing machine, but I thought that perhaps for the first time we could actually have a conversation about something. There was some nurturing, some wisdom that could be provided. He did not have the emotional capacity to discuss a breakup. He fixed the washing machine. I felt very angry that that's what happened that day. And I've since come to this realization. I mean, I know he came over a day early to do that because he, he knew I was upset and he did what he could do. And so that's the love. So now when people say to me, that's a nice top, Simon, is it new? No, my father loves me. And who knows who he is, really? Everything is perception. He came over recently and dealt with this incredible uh, family crisis that we were having, and he dealt with it so beautifully, like a trained counsellor. That was not my memory of him from childhood. In childhood, he was either angry or distant. So either we didn't know where he was, or we did, and it was not ideal. <laughs> he dealt with this so beautifully, with such patience and kindness. I said to him afterwards, who are you? How did you do that? And he said to me, this is what he actually said. About two years ago, I cut out wheat. <laughs> I could have had a happy childhood. <laughs> Instead of, don't disturb daddy, he's eaten a lot of pasta. <laughs> My dad didn't take up the invitation to see either of my last two stand-up shows. When pushed for a reason why, he said he thought I didn't need his validation anymore and it wasn't his sort of thing. I tried not to be hurt. I'm not into darts, but if I had a son who played professional darts and was receiving wonderful reviews, I'd watch him play darts, wouldn't I? Despite my father's lack of attendance, I used to see him in the audience anyway. Every time I spotted a man who wasn't laughing, I'd feel my father's indifference and say things like, do you think you'll laugh at any point or carry on with this face? If a man ever left to go to the toilet, I'd scream, Where are you going? How funny do I have to be, Daddy? In the end, I thought, do I really need my father's love? Can't I just love myself at this point and be grateful to the strangers who love me as long as I'm funny? I realised eventually that the problem was my expectation of this man as a father. I thought, let's stop thinking of him as my father and start thinking of him as the man who ejaculated. He ejaculated and so I'm alive. What more do I want? And often when men have ejaculated, they're tired. You can't expect them to love you. I can't keep thinking for the rest of my life, if you can't love a child, don't ejaculate in a person. Do it out the window. And if I'm to focus on anything, it should be on thanking my mother for birthing me out of her own body. How can I ever thank her for that? The best I can do is occasionally introduce her to a celebrity. Thank you for your womb. Here's Darren Brown. I'd let go of the idea of my father as my father, but then someone said, but he's your father, and I felt something. So we met up and he told me he'd just trained to be a hypnotherapist. In my head I screamed, what? You can't be the healer, you're the trauma. He then said he just needed some clients to get started. What he'd love was for my crazy friends to come and see him so he could be a hypnotherapist to the stars. I said nothing, because why tell someone how you feel at the time when you could save it up for a book and invite them to a launch that won't be their sort of thing? Yet through his hypnotherapy training, my father seemed to have developed a language for expressing more emotions than I'd witnessed in him before. We spoke about his childhood. He told me he had a very cold, distant mother, which must be worse than having a distant father. So it turned out he was the more vulnerable one, and I had to love him. How did he turn it around? I realised I could no longer feel hostile to this sneaky little hypnotist. Yet I'd also come to a place where there was a mild sadness, but an acceptance of the fact that we didn't really have a relationship. I finally knew in my body that he wasn't going to become a different person. I forgave him, but didn't necessarily need to see him, which I think is a valid position to hold. And then my mum called me, very upset because I hadn't been invited to his daughter's, my half-sister's, bat mitzvah, on account of having a boyfriend who is a boy. In the Jewish religion, if you're a boy and you have a boyfriend, it's very important that he's a girl. That line is straight out of the Torah. I said to my mum, of course we haven't been invited, it's fine. He's not a monster, he just has a religion without which he can't cope. You can't be angry, he's just a man with special needs. 
And having said that out loud, I felt like I'd finally shifted all the rage. I was over any need for my father's acceptance, validation or attention. I was at peace. And then the next evening, I received an email inviting my boyfriend and I to the bat mitzvah. I was furious. All that work to accept that he would never change. And then he changed. I tried everything to make him be okay with me. How dare he decide the fight is over? I called him a few days after the email. Following some polite chit-chat, I cautiously said, So you've had a bit of a change of heart? He said, Not really. I said, Something happened, no? He said, Listen, let's say you were in St John's Wood and you wanted me to drive you to Edgware, which already made no sense. He continued, And on the drive, you fell asleep. Then when you woke up, you were exactly where you wanted to be. Would it matter how we got there? I thought about this. Does it matter how we've got here? And then I said, hang on, I haven't been asleep for 20 years. Then, because I was scared I wouldn't be able to stop shouting at him if I started, I just said, you know, feelings have been felt. He said, I understand. And I decided to hear, I'm sorry. Because often it's best to make up the words you need to hear. Like when he said, you don't need my validation anymore. I could have heard, I couldn't be more proud of you. He also suggested this has all been very good material for me, which was difficult to argue with. My father also asks if I can bring some of my magic tricks that I used to do so I can entertain all the children. Because when I was, I wish this was quite a bit younger, 17. <laughs> because nobody ever said to me, oh, it's nice, Simon, all this magic. You might like sex. <laughs> so I had no sex till I was 21. I really had to make up for lost times. There's been quite a bit of sex, but now I very much miss the magic. <laughs> My boyfriend and I went to the bat mitzvah. In contrast to the tension I felt at his wedding, I felt incredibly peaceful. As I walked in, I could see how vulnerable my dad was. It must have been quite scary for him having us there. One of the first people I saw was a woman who years before had tried to convert me to Orthodox Judaism. When I told her I didn't think it was for me, she said, but are you happy? And I wasn't happy, so I thought, oh, she's got me. Seeing this woman again, I thought, I'm happy now. She said, it's been a long time. Are you married? I gestured to my boyfriend and said, no, I've been with this guy for five years. She looked nervous, and I could have left her hanging, but I filled the space by telling her how great he was. She said, OK, I, I guess that's OK. I agree that it was OK. And then she walked away. I thought, yes, I killed her with love. Then a rabbi came over, and I took a deep breath, because I thought, I don't know how many of these I can do. I asked him what he gets up to when he's not hosting bat mitzvahs. He said he also does weddings and suggested he could do my wedding. I was about to say, oh, well, you won't, because you won't. But instead, I just smiled. He asked if I was married already, and I pointed towards my boyfriend again. The rabbi didn't know what to say, so he hugged me. In the hug, I went from feeling alarmed to patronised to realising he wasn't hugging me. I was hugging a child who had just heard something that had scared him. It feels like a sort of unkind thing to do to attack religious people, and it feels, you know, it feels too easy, and like the battle's already been won, and... <laughs> But, but really, it just feels rude. Like, if you're at a party and someone says, you know, you get into a conversation, someone says, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Jew, it's very rude there to say, oh, how ridiculous. <laughs> I feel at this point we have to treat people with kindness and love and respect in the, in the same way you treat a child running around a party saying, oh, I'm a helicopter. <laughs> and say, good for you, we're all having fun, I'm a choo-choo train. <laughs> There's a calm now to my relationship with my father. We stopped wanting to fix each other. And I've accepted that everything that happened couldn't have been any different. If it had been, I'd be an entirely different person, so to want to alter the past would only be another form of self-hate. The key story I have for remembering that my father is just a fallible man is this one. When I was 10, my mum was pregnant for the fourth time. I was about to have a sister, so a wife. When's my wife due, mummy? At the time, our two pet rabbits had just had five of their own babies. My mum was concerned that there would soon be a human baby crawling around the garden and didn't want there to be rabbit droppings everywhere. So she asked my dad to rehome the rabbits. How would he do this? My father took my seven-year-old brother and me to the local park and set the rabbits free. A dog came. We watched as the dog chased and mauled at least two of the smallest rabbits. My brother cried. I kept it all inside where it stayed for 20 years. 
And when I think about the baby rabbits, I know that if they'd been looking up at my father, desperately searching for an explanation or an apology, they would have only suffered more. Better for the baby rabbits to think, this is just a man who doesn't know what he's doing. Chapter 6. Saving the Boy I, when I was turning 30, had a crisis. And I didn't even know it was going to be a crisis until this moment. I was wandering along a street in some skinny jeans, trainers, and a yellow hoodie. And I suddenly saw a reflection of myself in a shop window <laughs> and thought, does my head look too old for these clothes? <laughs> and I couldn't concentrate on anything else that day because I thought everything in my life depends on youth. I'm sort of a bit cheeky. You have to be young for that. Oh, young Simon is so cheeky. Uncle Simon is creepy. <laughs> At 29, I began what would be two years of psychotherapy. I thought it would be fine to be 30, as long as I became a different person. I often feel like this must be some temporary personality before I get to the good one. Like, this can't be it for life. Like, this voice, this is my voice. <laughs> and I have this laugh now. I don't know when it started, and I'm gonna have to act it for you now, but this is my actual laugh in my life. <laughs> it's like I can't even experience prolonged joy. I was lonely and only ever attracted to vulnerable young men. The psychotherapist told me I had classic depression, which I was not happy about. I didn't mind having depression, but I would have preferred not to have the standard version. And I didn't think I was depressed. I thought I was profound. Life just is cyclical and it is repetitive. Do you know what I was thinking about when I was in the toilet the other morning? Again? It's always the same, isn't it? Once, about six years ago, I had a green shit. Once. <laughs> and it looked at me as if to say, perhaps everything will be different now. <laughs> I just left another therapist who told me, you're a claustrophobic narcissist and would benefit from group therapy. I found group therapy quite interesting in that I liked being the new person in a group and I loved hearing people talk so openly. Someone expressed upset about no longer being the youngest person in the group, which made me feel young again. A man in his early 50s spoke about having a new stepson who didn't like him and how the mother always sided with her son. Everyone was nodding and I was sat there thinking, she should side with the son, who the hell are you? You're not my real dad. I could see how the group situation could be transformative for everyone involved, but noticed after a few weeks that nothing seemed to be happening. I saw some progress. A woman who'd been sat slumped on a sofa each week suddenly sat up and was feeling better, but a week later went back to slumped. I asked why she was lying on the sofa again and she responded, I don't know, why do you laugh like that? About a month after I left the group, the therapist, whose aim was to cure me of my narcissism, emailed to say that she was writing a book about group therapy and wondered if it was okay to include a chapter she'd written about me called The Unsuitable Patient. I said yes. My friend recently told me that I think too much. I just think too much, which is fine, except he then very boastfully said to me, you know, I never think. <laughs> and I said, you do, you do think. And he said, no. <laughs> and I said, look, even if you don't discuss philosophy every moment of your life, you'll still come to some conclusions. Like when you wake up and you get out of bed, why do you do that? And he said, I've got work. <laughs> and then I got a bit annoyed and said, well, why don't you just kill yourself then? And then my other friend leaned in and said, he seems quite happy, don't ruin another life. <laughs> and I feel special in some way if I feel broken. If I'm broken, there's a journey to be healed. There's a journey to be fixed. I feel like I'm an interesting, unique human being and the meaninglessness of it all. I feel unique. I feel special. I like that I've got an osteopath appointment once a month where I go because I've got bad posture, something happened in my past, and I guess this man is healing me each month, bringing me some sort of neutral state, some pure neutral state. And I asked him, because he's quite a sensitive, sweet man, why, why did I end up with bad posture? Is it because when I was a kid I was quite shy? I ended up trying to make myself invisible from the other children, end up all hunched over and scared. And even though what I do now is extrovert, still inside, I'm the same scared, crying child. I said, what's wrong with me? Why would that happen to me? What's wrong with me? And he said, you have very tight hamstrings. <laughs> And 
Yeah, but isn't it more that I'm a genius recluse? Isn't that the... <laughs> no, the tendons behind your knees are quite restricted. Yeah, but isn't that just the physical manifestation of a tortured soul? No, it's your legs. <laughs> My new therapist, who was happy to provide one-on-one -on -one sessions, explained how they would work. I wasn't sure what to say, so I said, OK, fun. She looked at me concerned and said, it isn't fun. In her second session, I was being quite funny, and she suddenly said, it's really great that you can be funny, but you don't need to be funny in this room. I understood what she was saying and carried on talking until she interrupted with, you know, you don't have to be interesting. I was confused and asked, do you want me to tell these stories, but not as well? She wanted me to cry. She wanted a real emotional connection in the room so I could express some emotions in a relationship outside the room. She wanted me to be authentic and grounded, which I found quite tricky because I was so funny and interesting. Often we'd sit in silence. Even though I understood everything we discussed was confidential, I knew that I would definitely end up writing about it. She told me I could decide later if what we spoke about would end up on stage and assured me that not everything had to be made public. It took me a while to accept this. Eventually we discussed age. What if I age? Well, you will. I don't want to. I didn't know why ageing was such a problem for me. It wasn't that if you age too much you end up dead. I was fine with death. It was getting older that terrified me. Getting older and not dying. I was at the theatre and I saw somebody who turned out to be 18. And he was with a woman who turned out to be his mother. But she, it turned out, was a fan of mine. So that's good. She likes my work. I like her son. Great. <laughs> Also, I've worked really hard since about the age of 14 to get to wherever the hell I am today, so if she's taken any enjoyment from my work, I think I've earned her child. <laughs> we get talking, and they're delightfully uber middle class. And I'm from Essex, and this feels like a, a moment where I've arrived. And then after the play, I meet up with just him outside the theatre. We're sat on the steps of this theatre. It's about 11.30 in the evening. There's a frisson between us. There's romance in the air. And then his mother comes around the corner. And I feel awkward. I think, oh gosh, the mother must love him and is protective of him. And she just says to him, OK, goodbye, darling. See you later. Leaves me with her son. So I thought, oh, she's given him to me. <laughs> So I, I took him, um... <laughs> he actually took me to this restaurant that he knew, it was his area, and we went to this late night restaurant. We spoke for two hours, and he was actually much more mature than you'd imagine for 18, and much more intelligent than you'd imagine for 18, and all those other things that people like me say. <laughs> we started meeting up for these kind of dates. They weren't defined as such, but they were essentially dates, and eventually I invited him back to my flat. I felt strange and torn about inviting him. I wasn't sure if it'd be a bit too much for him. And I'm not very good at making the first move. Like, in terms of the first kiss, I'm not very good at that. And I thought I would have to, because I'm the responsible adult here. <laughs> um, and then we were sat for like three hours on my sofa, just talking and talking, and I couldn't quite make the move. I felt just awkward about it. I wasn't sure what, and it was hard for him as well, because he's straight, so it's difficult. <laughs> But everything is seemingly leading towards this kiss. We're edging close to each other, subtly on the sofa. And at one point, I realised I had to kiss him because I found myself fiddling with his hair. And I thought, well, I've got to do the kiss now because that's a precursor to a kiss. If you don't then do the kiss, you're just a weirdo who likes hair. <laughs> well, it's been lovely touching your hair this evening. <laughs> Let yourself out. So I leaned in and I kissed him on the lips and said, I've just kissed you on the lips. <laughs> Is that okay? And he said, oh yeah, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> I leaned in again. I kissed him again. I said, I've just kissed you on the lips again because kids love repetition. <laughs> And actually, it was a really lovely experience for both of us. I don't feel any shame or regret about it. Now, I, look, it's not ideal being with an 18-year-old. There's nothing we can do about the fact that he was 18. There's nothing we can do about the fact that if I met him five weeks before that, he would have been 17. Nothing we can do, nothing the police can do. No one can do anything. I realise now that my panic about getting older, much more than vanity, 
was about ending up further away from my teenage self. When I was 18, it seemed impossible to just accept who I was and have some fun with another 18-year-old, and this was one of the key revelations from therapy. I kept being drawn to these young, vulnerable men in an attempt to save the 18-year-old in me who wasn't saved. You may prefer to think of me as a pervert, but that is an official medical diagnosis. Around the same time, I met a skinny boy with big curly hair at a party in Amsterdam. I was in Amsterdam for about three days, thinking about sex the whole time that I was there, apart from, I don't know, 40 minutes in the Anne Frank Museum. <laughs> and I was there for an hour. <laughs> he was talking to a much older man and looked like he needed to be rescued by a slightly less older man. He was incredibly cute. He told me about his depression, anxiety, his inability to sleep. I was really turned on. I told him about a guided meditation series that I'd found helpful. We went back to my hotel room and it occurred to me that I had this meditation series with me. So I gave him my headphones and said, I'm going to the toilet, but have a listen to this. When I walked out of the bathroom, he was asleep. Apparently my need to save him was greater than my desire to do anything else, or his need for sleep was greater than his desire for me. And I, I, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know why I kept going for the same sort of weird, vulnerable, quiet person. And then I realised it comes directly from being about 15 years old and watching the teen drama My So-Called Life starring Jared Leto as Jordan Catalano. <laughs> Everyone I've ever gone for has been some version of Jordan Catalano. I watched the DVD to see, you know, what it was about this character, and I figured, I figured it was about, it was these three things. Number one, he has about four lines in every episode. <laughs> Number two, he has long hair that sometimes falls over an eye. <laughs> and he'll tuck it behind his ear. Which is amazing, isn't it? It's just amazing. <laughs> And the third thing is that his main character trait is that he is dyslexic. And that's all I've ever wanted. <laughs> A near mute <laughs> with long hair and learning difficulties. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with any of those things. I don't want to offend anyone. If that describes you in any way, I'd like to meet you. <laughs> Recently, I went to see a play in which there was an actor that I fancied, because if you don't seek some therapy, life repeats. <laughs> this time I was slightly better connected. I knew the playwright. We went to eat after the play. I was sat next to the actor that I fancied. I was talking to him that we live in a culture where you can order stuff online and it comes within the next day or two. We live like that now. And so it's frustrating to not be able to order a specific human being from the universe and have them come towards you. He says, well, what do you want? Who do you want? I say, and I hadn't thought about this for a while, I say, I want Jared Leto. <laughs> he then says, in that moment, I just did a film with Jared Leto where I played the younger version of his character. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with that. <laughs> I'd only just ordered him. <laughs> He then says, out of his mouth, do you want to see a sex scene I did as the young Jared Leto? <laughs> I say, yes. <laughs> and it's so close to the fantasy, I don't know what to do. That is the root fantasy. That's the young Jared Leto. It's even closer to the fantasy than the actual Jared Leto in real life now, who, oddly, I did meet about three years ago in Thailand at a full moon party. I didn't realise it was him. I thought it was just someone who looked like him. So I went up to him and said, you look a lot like Jared Leto. Do you know who Jared Leto is? He said, oh, I am Jared Leto. I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> so all I could manage to say was, your beauty in Requiem for a Dream detracted from the narrative. <laughs> He thanked me and walked away. <laughs> I'm still friends with the young Jared Leto. He's incredibly beautiful, and that's possibly why he's my friend. He's very funny as well, but if he didn't have his face and hair, I think we'd do a lot more in email. 
I thought I was over any attraction to him recently, and then he took a hat off, and his hair, despite having been in a hat, was still incredible. If I put a hat on and then took it off, I'd have to go home. Beauty is too powerful. I feel mildly better now, but I used to see pretty boys and just feel tired. I see someone and think, oh great, now I have to think about you for ten years. I really enjoy spending time with him, but there's always this terrible regret that hangs over me that I should have kissed him, that there was this moment where I could have, but I was too sad and confused. We just inhaled some nitrous oxide from balloons. I don't do drugs, but I will if they come in balloons. <laughs> I fell back on the bed we were sat on with my arms splayed apart. He then fell back, his head landing in my arm. He said, this is the most erotic moment of my life. And because of self-hate, I thought, he's probably just said the wrong word. He probably means erratic or asthmatic. At 31, I found the ultimate vulnerable young me. Curly hair, depression, glasses, he had it all. I wanted to ask him to move in with me and never leave. He didn't move in, and then he left. I tried so hard to make him happy. He once looked directly at me and said, when you try to be funny or positive, it doesn't help. I thought, that's all I've got. It took a long time to even become a relationship, and I really wanted something real at that point in my life. And one night we had this whole discussion, and he said, look, maybe I don't want to be Simon Amstel's boyfriend, which was really hard for me to hear because... I am Simon Amstel. <laughs> Everything was going so well for about six months, and then he found this job, which meant we weren't seeing each other enough, and I wasn't sure if there was this tension now because of the job or just us, and I thought, if I could just put some dates in our diaries, there'll be stuff to look forward to, everything will be fine. And then we meet up in this park square. We're sat on a bench, and he says to me, I can't be in this relationship anymore. Can't. Can't was the word. And I thought, you could. <laughs> now pick a date. <laughs> but he could not discuss it at that point in his life, so we hugged and we parted. Then I felt like I may cry, which is quite odd for me, but I didn't feel like I could in the middle of this public park square, so I see a coffee shop in the distance. And I think I would go and cry in the toilet of that coffee shop, which was a worry, because often they don't let you cry unless you buy something first. <laughs> And there's all this build-up walking to the coffee shop. I don't have to buy anything. I close the door behind me, and I feel that because I'm so emotionally blocked, I feel one tear, and I'm so thrilled that happened, I stop crying. <laughs> I get home, and this is the hardest part for me. This is the problem. I get home, and I can't feel any of the pain. I go straight to my computer and start typing up what has happened so I can tell you people, and I'm so annoyed at my own fingers, like, why are we doing this? Because this is all we've got! <laughs> I felt sad for a long time after that. I really loved him and thought about him constantly. Once it was over, I remember meeting someone similar at a party. Skinny, funny, pretty. I think he may have even fancied me, and I couldn't be bothered. Something is very wrong if you meet someone you like and your body says, what for? I met up with him a while ago to discuss what had happened, and... One of the things he said to me was that he felt that I was vulnerable and I needed somebody to take care of me, to save me. This did not ring true at all until I was at a spa hotel in Spain recently. Because life lessons can come from anywhere. <laughs> Many will come tonight and you won't even realise. You'll think you've seen a comedy show and then tomorrow you'll think, perhaps I should leave my husband. <laughs> I request a massage at this hotel, and it isn't available. So the lady in charge asks if I'd like this other massage, which I haven't heard of, and also this flotation room treatment, which intrigues me. I say yes to both, thinking they would be two separate events. <laughs> what it turned out to be was me lying back in warm water in a dark room with a man swinging me about. <laughs> And I loved it. <laughs> it was this strange womb-like space, and it felt like he was everything in that womb. Mother, father, brother, lover, and also relieving neck and shoulder pain wonderfully. <laughs> I also found him quite attractive, and not my usual type. He was quite a muscular chap, and I normally go for somebody with no muscles, no bottom, just a stick and a head. This... <laughs> 
this guy, not only did he have this, this strong body, he had this like kind, vulnerable face, which is a good combination for me. He had like this, this swimmer's body, but the face of someone who maybe can't even swim. <laughs> His body saying, I will heal and protect you. His face saying, unless I drown. <laughs> and as he's massaging my shoulders in the water, in the darkness, I can feel his breath on my face. And I think, there are no laws in the womb. <laughs> I, could, I could perhaps just lean up and kiss him, couldn't I? I couldn't fear even in that womb-like, dream-like space, was still present. I was so annoyed at my own fear. And then I told this to a friend, and he said, it's good fear was present, that would have been really odd. <laughs> so what happened instead was eventually he got out of the water and told me to get dressed when I was ready. And then I, because he had been healing me and taking care of me, ended up saying, are you sure you don't want to get back in? Like a crazed middle-aged housewife. <laughs> Please, my husband won't touch me. <laughs> Around this time, I'd been on two stand-up tours, No Self and Do Nothing, with my friend and occasional support act, Arnab Chanda. The first time we played Oxford, we bumped into a group of young men on the street after the show. I don't think they'd been in the audience, but they were walking past the stage door when we came out. We got talking and then went to see a band playing nearby. I, of course, fancied one of them. Freddie, and we began talking in the bar of the music venue about his various issues. The whole group ended up at our hotel bar. His brother told me that he thought Freddie was gay but hadn't figured it out yet and asked if I would help. I said I'd try my best. We ended up in my room, sat on the bed. Freddie said that he felt he should tell me he was straight and was worried he'd led me on. So we spoke for about two hours on a bed. I liked speaking to him. I really wanted to kiss him. He said he didn't want me to feel like he was only in there because of who I was, and I didn't want him to feel like he was only in there because I wanted to sleep with him, so we were a bit stuck. There was a lot of moving around the room. As he smoked out of the window, I was becoming more and more exhausted trying to figure out what this actually was. Was he interested? Lonely? More lonely than me? Confused? More confused than me? He told me he'd been with boys before, but wasn't sure if he was into it. I said, right, yeah, it's tricky. I feel a bit horrified by this story now. I just wanted to feel something other than lonely. He may have wanted a friend more than he wanted sex. I listened to him, gave some advice, but I guess it wasn't very pure as I wanted sex more than I wanted a friend. Why couldn't it have been both? I was feeling like I should be assertive and take a risk. I said something like, maybe I should just kiss you and see how that goes. I went to kiss him and he pulled away. I thought, OK, this all feels a bit humiliating now, and I said I was tired. He looked guilty. He said he shouldn't have come to the room. I said it was all fine, it had been fun and I just needed to sleep. We hugged goodbye. Mid-hug, to cover my frustration and shame, I made a stupid joke about how he should probably go before he gets an erection. He half smiled and I apologised for the joke. Before he left, he said he'd like to see me in London. I said, sure, and closed the door. I collapsed on the bed and said to myself, oh my God, what am I doing? What do I have to do? When he came to London, he texted me. I responded, have you figured out who you are yet? Which was a bit aggressive, but I thought I couldn't keep chasing this confused boy around. He texted back, pervert, and I didn't text back. Now I can see that he was trying to tell me to stop being pushy in a way that was funny, but I just felt annoyed. I always felt that the unbearably pretty boy in these situations had all the power. I don't think I ever appreciated that I must have appeared quite confident and smart, as most of the time I just felt needy and sad. Later I ignored a text that was something to do with his photography, and then a year or two later Arnav and I were doing another show in Oxford. Freddie texted saying he'd be in the audience and asked if we'd be going out again after. I didn't reply. His brother had also contacted Arnav to say they'd be there. They were at the stage door when we finished. I said hello, and Freddy asked where the party was. I told him we were just going back to the hotel to sleep. He looked disappointed. We got in the car. I felt bad and asked Arnab if it was the right thing to do. He said, yeah, after last time, of course. One or two years later, I was sat in my flat with Arnab and some other friends when he suddenly said out of nowhere, oh, did you hear about Freddy? He killed himself. It felt worse than being dumped by the first person I'd loved. I kept seeing his face through the back window of the car as we drove away from the stage door. I had ignored his messages. I didn't help. I thought if I'd just kissed him without announcing I was going to try to kiss him, I could have saved him. He needed me to be assertive. I was supposed to tell him he was okay. But what ego insanity is this? I knew there were hundreds of people who actually knew him who couldn't have done anything. But I thought, the point of me, if I'm here for anything, is to help young gay people know that they're okay. To save the 18-year-old who wasn't saved. 
Why did I reject him? I tried to stop thinking about it because it was too painful. I'd failed in the only thing that meant anything to me. I was numb. I tried not to think about the possibility that he may have been sat in the audience for that first tour where I said, Is there anything worse than being alive? Is there? Is there anything worse? Death is not going to be worse than being alive. If you think about it, death is going to be a lot less bother. Have you got the dentist today? No. I am dead. It's ideal, ideal. So my message there is if you're ever feeling like you just can't go on, don't. Chapter seven, Ayahuasca. The other thing to know about this story is that it isn't rational. I tried to find peace in the rational world and I couldn't find it. I found myself in Peru drinking this plant medicine with a shaman. And what I'm about to tell you will sound perhaps like a bit of a crazy drug trip, but I promise you it isn't that. I'd been in psychotherapy for two years and while I'd begun to understand a lot of what was wrong with me, we hadn't got to the bottom of why I often felt sad for no reason. More than that, the end of my last relationship and Freddie's suicide meant I was now unable to feel anything. And I just met someone I liked. I really wanted to feel it. I heard about ayahuasca at a dinner with some old school friends. I didn't really understand what ayahuasca was, but when my friend spoke about it, his face beamed with such joy and enthusiasm, he looked like he was about nine years old. I asked him to send me the details, and then I flew to Peru. And so I find myself now on this spiritual journey to overcome ego, which would be great, except it's such an egotistical journey to be on. I have a friend, and, and he's on the same journey as I am, and it is clear yet unspoken that we are now in competition. <laughs> so I will say something like, I'm going to Peru next month to visit a shaman. We are going to drink this plant medicine that has been used by the indigenous people for thousands of years to heal themselves. And he will say, oh yeah, I, I know the guy who invented Peru. <laughs> And he is winning, but what I've realised is that any competition is ridiculous because nobody wins this thing, we all just die. So, to do anything from a point of ego is absurd. To do something from just the joy of doing it in that moment, there's some integrity there. So what I thought was, if I can just do everything in my life from now on, from a point of pure joy rather than any ego, then I'll be the best. <laughs> I wasn't sure if what happened to me in Peru could be stand-up comedy. It was such a personal and totally peculiar thing. It had saved my life, and I didn't want to diminish it. I didn't even name the plant medicine, as I was concerned I would misrepresent or appropriate something that I had no right even discussing. I still don't understand what happened. It was so far from anything that makes sense in this culture that to even begin talking about it with any authority would be ridiculous. But I thought I could talk about what happened for me personally as one particular clown with depression. Ayahuasca is a thick brew made from the vine Banisteriopsis carpi, often called carpi, and the leaf Psychotria viridis, known as Sharuna. It tastes quite bad, but you end up experiencing consciousness-expanding, life-altering visions and connect to who you really are, so it feels worth it. It was unlike any consciousness-expanding substance I've ever tried. I've enjoyed magic mushrooms in my life, because I don't do drugs, but I will if they contain magic. I think it's quite similar to what happened to me when I did magic mushrooms a few years ago. <laughs> Somehow I was able to say to my friend on mushrooms, and I think it's this sort of conversation that we're all constantly having that stops us from progressing at the speed that we perhaps could. Isn't it odd how when you say to someone, oh, do you want to meet up for some dinner next Thursday? The dinner is a lie. What you're really saying is, it'd be nice to meet up with you. I haven't seen you for a while. Why do we have to have this dinner cover? How do you know how hungry you're going to be on Thursday? <laughs> Why can't we just say it'd be nice to meet up with you and there should be a place where you can just meet, the meeting place, an indoor place where you walk in, you sit down, there's nothing, just chairs and you sit down and you look at each other and you meet and it's truthful, it's authentic, it's beautiful. And then I thought, after about half an hour there, you could get a bit hungry. <laughs> On Magic Mushrooms, I just giggled for hours. In contrast, ayahuasca was a traumatic healing experience over four ritualized ceremonies led by shamans who had been working with the medicine for decades. We were encouraged to refer to ayahuasca as a healing plant medicine, not a hallucinogenic drug, which has connotations of other substances that may be quite wonderful, but are not used as part of a healing ritual that has been performed for thousands of years by people in the rainforest using nature alone. 
I did a terrifyingly minimal amount of research before I went, but when I arrived, I was told that this is a medicine that calls to you. When my friend's story came up at dinner, it was actually the third time I'd heard the word ayahuasca, so it made sense to me that I'd been called to the rainforest. When I told my new boyfriend this, he said, yeah, I keep hearing the word skiing. To get to the rainforest, I flew to Iquitos International Airport, as did 11 other people from around the world. All there for various different reasons. Depression, it's mainly depression. <laughs> the shaman, who was an American man called Don Howard, picked everyone up and escorted us to his van. He drove us to a small boat, and then we sailed through the rainforest, which I found healing in itself. It reminded me of being in Thailand on my own. I wondered why I hadn't done more of this. And it was clear that I was there because I couldn't be in a group of people without anxiety. And I know that's odd, me saying that, because I, I do this. But this was the only way I could cope with talking to people. Raised and lit. <laughs> we each had our own basic hut, a single bed, a toilet and a sink. There were a few showers along wooden walkways, which were our route to the large teepee structure where the ceremonies would take place. There was also a balcony overlooking the river where we ate and an indoor structure for the talking circles, which happened the day after each ceremony. I didn't get to know anyone at first because I saw myself as separate from these other troubled loons. And in such a laid-back atmosphere, I felt incredibly tense. There was a very loose schedule and I couldn't cope. I wanted to know how long each meal or section of the retreat was going to last so I could plan how long my set was. I took a small notebook with me. I often take a little notepad with me so I can pretend to be making some notes on something. Not really, just if anyone is looking. Oh, is he lonely? Oh, no, he must be a travelling genius. <laughs> Unfortunately, this notebook mainly reveals my depression and need to feel it was a good idea to be alone in Peru, drinking something I didn't understand. This is what I wrote. Please remember I was classically depressed. It is clear I am here to overcome fear, anxiety, the need to control... I must let go of everything. I trust that I will be taken care of here. I just need to breathe, accept, let go, accept, do nothing, let go, accept, do nothing, accept, let go. I want to be here. It is important I am here. I have travelled far. I am not an observer watching a film of characters. I am here. I am here. I was there. I had travelled far. I think the problem comes from the inability to just be purely in the moment without fear. I think we're all stuck in the past and looking to the future, and it's in the moment where true joy exists. It's in the moment where love can occur. It's only in the moment where you can be fully at one with the universe. I was in Paris recently with a new group of people, one of which was quite a sort of kooky, interesting girl. Although in hindsight, not that interesting. <laughs> I always get fooled. I was thinking, oh, she seems fascinating. Is she Simon? Or does she just have short hair? <laughs> completely fascinated. And I'm thinking, oh, I'll talk to her for the rest of my life. Bored after 10 minutes. You should grow your hair and stop misleading people. <laughs> so she suggests at about, at about three in the morning that we all run up the Champs-Élysées to the Arc de Triomphe. And I guess telling you about that now sounds sort of exciting and fun, but at the time, I just thought, well, why would we do that? And then, and then what's the point? And then when we get there, then what will we do with our lives? And I'm sort of analysing what the point of it is, and we live that way, and it seems a long way to go. And everyone else is just not analysing, they're just running, and I'm running as well because of the peer pressure, because I'm fun. <laughs> And we're all running and running. And everyone else, I think, is just at one with the moment, at one with joy, at one with the universe. And I'm there, as I'm running, thinking, well, this will probably make a good memory. <laughs> Which is living in the future, discussing the past with someone who, if they asked you, oh, what does it feel like? I don't know, I was thinking about what I'd say to you. <laughs> we are about to sit in a circle and tell each other about ourselves. I wonder if I can do this in an emotionally open and calm way. I couldn't. I was funny. I don't know what I'm afraid of. What is so terrible about silence? I panic that people won't be able to cope. That I need to take care of them. Like my mum? I wonder who I am if I'm not these defence mechanisms. The first ceremony is tonight. There were four ceremonies, and each one we sat in a circle in total darkness. We drank this medicine. In the second ceremony, I was reborn. We don't have time to discuss that, but I was reborn. <laughs> we now have time. Ceremony one. We were given a small bucket to be sick in and the choice of a rocking chair or a yoga mat. I decided I was much too cool to be sat in a rocking chair, so suffered the consequence of having to sit up straight for four hours. 
Along with Don Howard, the ceremony was led by a second shaman from Peru, Don Robert. I trusted the shamans completely, even though they entered the teepee in matching outfits. We were each asked to approach them one at a time to drink. It didn't taste that bad, and I was pleased to be there, ready for whatever was about to happen. I told myself to relax, have an open heart, do nothing, accept, and let go. Nothing happened. I couldn't let go. I tried singing Let It Be to myself. I really wanted to throw up. Everyone else was throwing up. It was embarrassing. I decided I must just be pure. Then I remembered I came into the jungle for actual reasons and needed to purge as much as anyone. But making an effort would not work, and making an effort to not make an effort would not work. So I just started nodding my head and squeezing my ankle in time to the music. I shook back and forwards a bit, and I could feel something was coming. I told myself, let it come, let it come, because I knew I could have stopped it, which would have been more polite in normal circumstances, but buckets were provided. So I said, come, and it came. Not a lot of anything volume-wise, but it felt like something substantial had occurred. Almost instantly, I felt clear, well, pure. I thought maybe my depression is in that bucket now. I decided to let the visions come. I tried to relax, and trying to relax meant I couldn't relax. I wondered if I'd come all this way to throw up and sit in the dark. I could hear other people making noises that suggested they were experiencing life-changing visions, and I was just sat there singing Let It Be to myself. After a few hours, I noticed the songs that had been coming from the left of the room were now coming from the centre. Each person was having the song sung to them whilst being hit on the head with some leaves. I was pleased it was almost over and found being sung to and hit over the head quite nurturing. I told myself to feel that. A candle was lit. The ceremony was over. I was ready to go, but then felt horribly nauseous again. Was I about to throw up? I'd already let it go at the appropriate time and in a polite, delicate manner. I decided I'd wait until I got back to my room. Then I remembered someone saying that if you do that, you end up with a pretty disgusting room. So I thought, fuck it, who cares, do it. And it came, loudly, horribly, there was a lot of it. I could hear the shame and laughing, and I thought, this isn't funny, is this funny? I didn't feel pure after the second purge. I felt ill, weak, and angry at the room for doing this to me. I walked to my room destroyed. Turn the lights on, too bright, turn them off. I felt dizzy. I only had the energy to brush my teeth. I crawled into bed. I noticed my right hand was shaking, like it was wondering what had just happened. I felt bad for what I'd done to my body. I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's not your fault. I started having conversations with various parts of my body until I decided I sounded like a maniac and shouldn't be separating myself from my body. I told myself to shush and eventually calm down. I wondered who was doing this shushing. Who was shushing who? I woke up still feeling terribly weak. On the bright side, I couldn't feel too anxious about talking to people. There was a flower bath to keep the medicine in the body and keep unwanted purged elements out. I thought this would be a jacuzzi, but it was a small washing up bowl full of cold water and flowers thrown over my near naked body along with some more singing and leaf head hitting. I have no idea how I'm going to explain any of this when I get home. I'm still feeling like this will bring a newfound self that is comfortable, content, able to feel. It's just quite a tough way of getting there. Ceremony 2. Second ceremony last night. Part of me doesn't want to spoil it with words. I decided to sit in a rocking chair. I wasn't going to try to do anything. Just listen to the music. I rocked in time to the music. I hadn't slept before the ceremony despite trying, so I was quite sleepy when it began, which felt good. No energy to do anything. I surrendered to the medicine and then threw up. I purged quite a lot and it almost felt good. I was grateful. I said thank you. We'd been told to thank the medicine for whatever she provided. What happened next was so strange I can only apologise for not being a better writer who could describe this experience in a way that makes sense. I could suddenly feel my head being moved around by what looked like large leaf hands, gently pushing and catching my head from left to right. I was finally having visions. My eyes were closed, so when I say saw, it's only because I'm not sure what the correct word would be. More than seeing the visions, I was feeling them, moving me, holding me. I wasn't sure if it was just me doing the moving, but it didn't feel like I was in charge anymore. It felt like the rainforest knew I had bad posture and was going to fix me. I said, thank you. Wonderful. Once the big leaf hands had finished with me, I found myself in a plasma-like bubble. I didn't know where I was, but it felt lovely. It was a living organism. I could see small tentacles moving with some kind of job to do, like they were making me. I was in the womb. It's always the womb. I felt very safe, happy, even when I felt nauseous and needed to put my head between my legs. When I moved, the vision moved with me. I was protected in my bubble. Then I was a baby in a pram, being rocked by my mother slash mother ayahuasca. I felt incredibly content. I was being looked after. I was safe. I was loved. 
But then I heard the girl sit opposite me screaming and crying like she was being chased. I noticed my mother wasn't in the room anymore. The rocking had stopped. I had a vision of my mother screaming and crying and another of my dad slapping her across the face. I felt myself tense over, my little shoulders rounded, my baby stomach tightened. I needed to do something to stop this man from hurting my mum. And then something in the rainforest said to me, you couldn't do anything. You were just a baby. You couldn't even crawl. I sobbed and kept repeating or hearing, you were just a baby. You couldn't even crawl. I cried and forgave my baby self for not doing anything. I cried for all the anxiety and depression that had followed. Everything pointed back to this moment. The round shoulders, the stomach problems, the shyness, the terror of going anywhere without my mum. I thanked Ayahuasca. I said, I know this is what I'm supposed to say, but thank you. I really do appreciate this. Thank you. Really. I said I'd like to be able to sit up straight. The reply was, then sit up. And beyond my control, my hands came together in my hair and pulled my head up as if I was about to be scalped. I was sat upright. I danced in the chair and cried. The depression had been unlocked. I was free. I had found the root of the shyness of the reason I ever needed to be funny. It was the key to my entire ridiculous personality. I'm okay with my personality, but sometimes it's nice to have it as a choice rather than a panic button. To choose to be quiet or funny in the situation is more fun than having to make people laugh so they don't hurt you. And then, although no one had said that this was a place where I could contact the dead, I said I would like to see Freddy. Freddy appeared, relaxed, smiling, cute, better than the sad, anxious boy I met in Oxford. He looked like he was okay. I can't remember what we said at first, but quite soon I asked him, sadly, am I just talking to myself here? And he said, just go with it, which made me laugh, and I carried on. I started asking him questions about why he had killed himself, and then realised I was rambling on and on in the same way I'd rambled on in the hotel room when I should have just had the confidence to be with him and kiss him. And then he kissed me. The room spun around us, and still in the kiss I heard his voice say, I would have killed myself anyway. I cried a lot. I asked, why? Why did you? He shrugged and said, this is your time. But so are you, are you gay? Or he said, where I am now, it's not really a thing. It was so good to see him again. Everything seemed to finish about an hour and a half before the candle was lit. I said, thank you. It's so much. It's too much. And then, is there anything else? Because I'm here. She stroked my body gently and said, rest now. Rest now. I'd always dealt with trauma from the past in what seemed to me to be a fairly logical, positive way. I always said, whatever happened, it was perfect. And then something in the rainforest said to me, because it acted like a psychotherapeutic conversation, it wasn't perfect though, was it? And it was such a relief to accept that. I said, no, it wasn't. What was it then? And it said, it was what it was. And I said, but it's been very useful for what I do in my career. And it said, what you do is what you do. It is not a big deal. And this was a great relief, but also very insulting. <laughs> At the second talking circle, I could feel myself emerging as the person I hoped I might become, beyond my temporary personality before I get to the good one. In the first one, I'd avoided eye contact with anyone and only felt okay when people laughed. This time I made a point of grounding myself I told everyone what I'd seen and I cried. To cry in front of people was incredible, to see that no one would feel uncomfortable, that I didn't have to take care of anyone. Ceremony three. The first ceremony taught me surrender. I was reborn in the second and in the fourth I became a man. Nothing happened in the third. Ceremony four. As we drank for the final time, I could feel myself being quite solitary and missing out on being a member of this tribe. My healing had been deeply personal, but I was ready now to be with these people. I told myself, be in the room. Even before drinking the medicine, something was happening because I started singing in my head for some reason a prayer that a boy sings during his bar mitzvah where he becomes a man. Baruch Hu et Adonai Baruch Adonai Hamavora Le'olam Va'ed. And then I became a cat. <laughs> to my left in the circle was an attractive young American who had also become a cat. I heard him meowing. 
And I started thinking about him during the ceremony. Sexual thoughts. I found him quite attractive, but I felt ashamed to be thinking these thoughts during the ceremony. It felt wrong, inappropriate. And then something in the rainforest said to me, why do you feel ashamed? You are a strong, sexy cat. <laughs> And so then I turned to him, beyond my own control, the medicine was in charge now, and rather than saying something meek, like maybe we should kiss, I did this motion. <laughs> and then he, not his physical head, but perhaps his spirit cat energy in that moment, landed in my palm, and we kissed. And then I giggled, because I felt, oh, I thought, oh God, what a silly thing to have done, and what must he think? And then the rainforest said to me, why do you feel embarrassed? Look, he enjoyed it. I looked over and I had a vision of him enjoying it, but he also looked quite shocked. <laughs> so I said to him, do not be concerned. <laughs> this was just a moment between us. It is not your path. Continue. That was just one of the many lessons in how to be in a group without anxiety. All my fears came up in various forms. Each time I was terrified and then realised that by accepting them, they would disappear. At one point, my fist tried to plunge its way into my mouth. I was scared I was going to break my jaw and then somehow understood that the fear was only in my head, much more than my fist. I surrendered and let my arm do what it wanted. It pulled away. I found myself in a vast dome of breasts. And as one of the many breasts moved towards my face, my thumb made its way into my mouth, acting as a kind of physical surrogate for the nipple. I started sucking on my thumb, gulping down all the wisdom that Mother Nature wanted to feed me. I didn't want it to end. The thumb started coming out of my mouth as the huge breast pulled away. So I bit down on my thumb, but then heard a firm voice say, It's enough now. I apologised to Mother Nature for biting her nipple. I felt I had been taught the lesson of enough. I thought maybe as a baby I bit my mother's nipple, so I apologised to her too. I was feeling tired and then decided, why feel tired? You are here. Use this time. I said to the rainforest, tell me everything now, for I will not return. At one point, everyone in the room became a circle of gods, sat on thrones. And then Richard Dawkins walked in. He looked terribly shocked by what he was seeing. I laughed, but then felt bad. As one of the gods, I said to him, you have done great work, Richard. You were one of my best. Which seems arrogant and absurd now, but at the time it felt like an incredibly kind thing to say. When the last ceremony ended, I could still feel the medicine inside me. I felt these urges that I had to follow. They said, we need to feel the rain on your body. I stood completely naked in the rain and felt comfortable in my body for the first time in my life. I then heard, we need you to dance. I said, OK, but I, I think I need to do a poo first. Should I do the poo and then dance or dance now? The rainforest replied, you don't do the poo. It suddenly hit me like a revelation. I don't do the poo. <laughs> the most I do is allow the poo. <laughs> I thought this is so important. I can't wait to tell the people. Because <laughs> it hadn't occurred to me that the body is just breathing itself. We're only getting in the way of our natural selves. We should just be eating when we are hungry. No other reason. Sleeping when we are tired. Having sex when there is the urge and consent. But that is it. <laughs> and so I got my headphones and I put on some Michael Jackson. <laughs> As the music started, I noticed for the first time these wet curls in front of my eyes. Of course, mine from the rain. But in that moment, I thought, I am Michael Jackson. <laughs> After the last ayahuasca ceremony, I felt so grateful for what these leaves had allowed in me, I felt a great urge to hug a tree but couldn't find one, so hugged a wooden post. Even beyond any duty to repay nature, it suddenly seems so obvious that we can't continue to live as if we are separate from a planet that we are sitting on. Ayahuasca looked after me. She made me better. I don't feel separate anymore. I feel held. I learnt to feel, to be in the rainforest, rather than think and analyse, and I asked while I was there, what are we here for? What is the priority? Is it just joy? Everything else seems absurd. Is it just about joy? Are we just here for joy? Is it just joy? And then a tired looking gorilla appeared before me <laughs> and said, yes, it's all joy. <laughs> and I later wrote down, joy confirmed.
When I got back to my room, I tried to sleep, but the wisdom kept coming, and I wrote as much of it down as I could. I didn't mention any of these things in my stand-up show. I thought they were holy sentences that shouldn't be mocked. Each sentence was written on its own page, in capital letters, and circled. Instincts are right. We are Earth. Must help gorillas. I had a second vision of a gorilla who said, You need to help us which I think meant help nature, animals, the planet. I couldn't figure out how to help the gorillas, so I set up a direct debit to Fauna and Flora International. Wear your glasses, symbol of wisdom. Learn from young people. They are the new batch. Read the Torah. You wrote it. My head was buzzing. I was lying on the bed wide awake, and then for around three seconds there was a burst of heavy rain. It felt like nature was saying, shh like the rain was stroking my head and suggesting it was time to sleep. As soon as I calmed down, the rain stopped. I wondered if I could make the rain come again, but didn't want to test it. Before I could fall asleep, I felt quite curious to see what would happen if I looked in a mirror. I swayed forwards and backwards, looking deeply into my own eyes, and then in a flash, my face froze like a mask, and I heard the words, You are God looking through you. In the moment, it made complete sense and resolved everything. The self is a construct, the body a vessel for some kind of consciousness to experience itself for some reason or no reason. My face, my personality, my name, anything to do with me is not who I am. The reality of me is something within or underneath or beyond all of that silliness. And when I am anxious, depressed or lonely, it is a transient bit of nonsense covering the truth of what I actually am. The beyond words thing that is actually me. I don't know what this thing beyond the I is, but the fact that I am the one asking the question is probably the reason. In the past, when I've heard people say, or even when I've said, that everything is connected, I couldn't really feel what that meant. But now, in my body, I get that I'm a small part of something much deeper and more expansive than anything my ego could come up with. Looking back through the stories in this book, when I've suffered, it has been the result of my mind creating a desire to get somewhere other than the moment I'm in. When I'm able to surrender to what is, I feel an ease and flow that doesn't seem to happen when I'm driven by my own lunacy. I'm aware that my ego probably likes the idea of having this brilliant connection to everything, but I don't know what we can do about that. And something changed in me when I got back to England. I was wandering along a country path with some friends and this guard dog came out of nowhere and started barking at us. It was quite scary. My friend said, let's just keep walking. I would have followed him in the past. In this moment, I stood there stared at this dog until it walked away. And what a stupid dog, because I'm a cat. <laughs> I wasn't broken anymore. Ayahuasca got to the core of how my identity was constructed. I found a strength I didn't know I had. When I feel sad now, I know it's not because I'm a broken human being. It's because it is one of the emotions that human beings feel. Chapter 8 after Ayahuasca. A wound that needed status to avoid intimacy had been healed. I was healthy. I was in a relationship with someone who had a happy childhood. How would I now find the motivation to earn attention from strangers? I didn't seem to have depression anymore, yet I still had a mortgage. I was becoming a normal person. I was happy, I felt alive, and had no idea what to do. There wasn't a clear spiritual path to follow when I arrived home, and my insecure little ego monster made a powerful comeback. Feeling betrayed by the joy-filled maniac I'd become, it grabbed me by the throat and said, you need to break America, become a highly respected dramatic actor, and write and direct a feature film, otherwise people will stop loving you. Deep down, I knew I'd found something that transcended all of that silliness, but I couldn't just keep looking at my face in the mirror, remembering that I was God looking through me, so I went to America. The career. It should just be about the joy at this point, right? But, you know, once you attain some status, you then have to retain that status. I decided about two or three years ago that it would be very important, important for me to go to America and become accepted as a comedian there. And only because other people had done that, I thought it'd start to get a bit embarrassing for me if I didn't. Like, who am I if I don't do that? Some regional comedian <laughs> who's a bit famous on one tiny island, and if I go anywhere else, I'm... I'm you! <laughs> I 
I did this residency in New York City, and it should have been pure joy to be doing this show for three months in New York, and everything became about my ego's need to get somewhere. And finally somebody said to me, Simon, you're doing a show in New York. If you're not happy now, you'll never be happy. And I thought, I'll never be happy. <laughs> Ayahuasca had provided a powerful burst of enlightenment, but without some kind of daily practice, I still occasionally fell back into existential misery. Because it doesn't matter what you do, what you achieve, the ending is always the same. You win the Olympics, you die. You buy your dream home, you die. You're pregnant, oh, you both die. And forget that we're all going to die. We're all going to live for so long. Someone said to me, in 40 years you'll be 77, and I thought, how long is this going to go on for? It used to be you were born, married at 12, by 16 you were dead. And now you have to keep doing new and endlessly impressive things because of the horror of being asked at parties, what are you up to at the moment? Isn't it enough that I grew up in Essex and now I'm at this party in Hampstead? I did it. But it's difficult to stay connected to that joy, to your true self, if you watch the news. So I've stopped doing that because it isn't even the news. What they give us are the worst things they can come up with that have happened in the world that day. And that's not a fair representation of what's going on on our planet. If it was the news, I could watch it because it would be... Oh, hi. How are you? Did you have a nice day? The news team, we had a barbecue. <laughs> Let's see what we've got for you. So the sun came up again, grass continued to grow. Now, some people have died, but you never met. <laughs> so you can't feel bad about that. And don't feel bad about not feeling bad. That would be silly. And also, everything's being dealt with by experts. <laughs> If you're still watching, we can now go live to our Middle East correspondent, Harold. Harold, what can you tell us? Well, it's just ridiculous. Thank you, Harold. <laughs> Pursuing recognition as a stand-up in America worked out quite well in that I was performing sold-out shows and appearing on late-night chat shows. But being a stand-up comedian was only going to get me so far, and it suddenly became very important to become the new Kate Blanchett. I started reading scripts that meant nothing to me, being very charming in meetings that exhausted me and demoted stand-up to a stepping stone rather than the place where I felt most free. And I should be over all this ego now. I really thought I was over vanity. And then I went to see a low-budget film that I was in and it was the first time I'd seen my face on a cinema screen. A lot of actors can't even look at themselves. They won't watch the films. I came out of there thinking, my face should always be that big. <laughs> I got a hint that I didn't actually want to be a transformative actor after reading an interview that Eddie Redmayne gave about his year-long preparation for playing Stephen Hawking. I was aware that most actors would be thinking, I'd love to have the opportunity to do something so challenging. And I thought, who the hell can be bothered with this? I felt a bit better recently. i just finished writing a film and I thought, OK, we're OK. What's better than a film? And then my friend Russell Brand decided to start a revolution. <laughs> I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> We're both trained clowns, and he goes, yeah, I enjoy this clown work. I think I'm probably also Gandhi. <laughs> what are you up to, Simon? I've just finished writing a film. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it's going to be good. I'm just trying to save the world from ecological and economic disaster. What's the film about? Me? <laughs> I had an idea for a TV show recently. It was such a relief to have come up with something new that I could provide to people. And after about half an hour of thinking about this great new idea, I realised it was Brass Eye. <laughs> I didn't have an idea, I had a memory. <laughs> it's not like you even get what you used to get in show business, which was a feeling of real elevation. I get messages on Twitter that say, can you let us know what time the show finishes? We have to book a babysitter. <laughs> I'm the star. <laughs> Why do they think that's OK? You can't just talk to me. Near the end of the most recent tour of America, I met someone with incredible posture and eyes full of actual joy. I went up to him and said, how are you doing this? He told me about his spiritual journey, and I thought if I paid enough attention, he would provide the path that I required post-Ayahuasca. I told him I'd begun to enjoy meditating, that it was no longer something that I felt obliged to do. He said, do you know what that is? You've gone from discipline to blissipline. 
I laughed, and he didn't know why. He just looked at me with his silly, joy-filled eyes, thinking, why are you laughing? Don't you think you've gone to discipline? He was just another lovely and ridiculous human being. I must stop looking for a leader. Nobody is outside of ridiculous. Eventually, I was so drained from trying to be loved internationally, I had a minor breakdown in a hotel room in L.A. The meeting I had with an actor who I thought would be perfect to play the vulnerable young love interest in the film I'd written had been cancelled at the last minute, and I was suddenly in the terrifying position of being alone with nothing to do. I watched some Michael Jackson videos on YouTube. I found an advert he did for Pepsi in 1991 that I'd never seen before. It's just Michael sat on his own playing a grand piano in what feels like a very peaceful room. He's singing I'll Be There and looks content. I reach out my hand to you. I have faith in all you do. And just as he's about to sing Just Call My Name, the film cuts to a wide shot of the room and behind Michael is the young Jackson 5 Michael singing to his adult self Just Call My Name and I'll Be There. I started crying and I wasn't sure why. I laid myself down on the bed in the fetal position. Something about this boy singing to his adult self that if he needed him, he would be there. And the adult Michael, now in this peaceful room, able to sing back to his younger self that he would be there for him too. I realised this was the connection I had lost. I was so embarrassed by my younger self and I blamed his ambition for my dissatisfaction. Somehow, in this moment, I realised that while my personality was a construction of various defence mechanisms, abandoning them at this point was rather ungrateful. I do like being funny. I could carry on being funny. Still crying, half an hour later, I said out loud to my abandoned child self, I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I felt him say that it was okay. And then he told me I should probably write all this down just in case. I started laughing. It felt so good to be laughing with him. I later realised that fame was not what I wanted. It was connection. There's a sweet spot for fame. I really just want to be anonymous enough that I can go to a restaurant and eat with the person that I'm with, but not so anonymous that someone in that restaurant doesn't tell me that something I've done is brilliant. The Boyfriend My boyfriend and I have been together for almost six years. We met a few months before I went to Peru, and along with having to work out how to be in show business without a wound, I had to discover how to be in a healthy relationship. He's very different to anyone I've been with before, in that he's not someone I think I need to save. It isn't easy writing about this relationship, because I'm in it right now, and it seems to be working. I don't feel the need to deconstruct it, I want to protect it. And we talk about everything, so I don't spend as much time worrying about who I am in my head. This makes me happy, but possibly makes the rest of this chapter slightly less funny. There's also now another person to consider when deciding how honest I can be about us, but thankfully he's also quite into the truth. And I think it works because, amongst other things, we talk about other people we find attractive. I don't know if that's particularly revolutionary, but I was in a relationship years ago with such insecurity, I ended up having to say, I don't think anyone's attractive. I, I, I really... And it's weird, because before I met you, but they must have all moved. <laughs> But in the relationship I'm in now, we'll go and see some dance performance and we'll talk about the magic of the movements and the fluidity of the dancers and underneath all that, we know happily that what we're saying is it'd be nice to take one home and ruin his life. <laughs> and we should be able to do that because the tickets are so expensive. <laughs> Despite any of that, it's really the best relationship I've ever been in. The most, I mean, it's just wonderful. And yet, and yet, I fall asleep next to him in France and I have a dream that I'm in a dungeon being seduced by a wet slut boy. <laughs> and not wet from water, covered in lubricant. <laughs> and I should have known it was a dream because it was too much lubricant. <laughs> And I said to him, listen, I'm in, a, I'm in a relationship, I can't really get involved with you here, but, but uh, I couldn't stop him because he was such a slippery slut. <laughs> and I had such a great time, but then afterwards I thought, oh no, what have I done? I've betrayed the best relationship I've ever been in. It won't get better than that, what am I going to do? And then I woke up. Everything was fine. But then for the next week, all I could think was, I really love that sex dungeon. <laughs> Is that who I really am? Because you can't argue with the unconscious. Everything now in life just seems so appropriate and polite. Do you want another croissant, Simon? No! I want to shove this pan of chocolat up your bottom! <laughs> your body's so dry. <laughs> But look, 
as much as I love that sex dungeon, I know that's not ideal long term. I know that. <laughs> but I can't stop thinking about it. It feels like that's the truth of me. I'm this animal who wants to be there and everything else is just some societal expectation. And then I go to my boyfriend's mother's birthday dinner. And his little brother gives his beautiful speech about how much he loves his parents for accepting their children no matter who they turned out to be. And I start crying, which surprises me. And I guess I'm thinking about the acceptance here in contrast to the problems I've had over the years at certain times with my own family. And I turn to my boyfriend and I say, this is better than a sex dungeon. <laughs> My boyfriend's family were completely accepting of me. I found this strange and unnerving. It's a bit like what happened with my little brother's hamster. He never cleaned the cage, and so the hamster grew accustomed to the dirt. Then one day, my brother cleaned the cage, and the hamster died of shock. It took me a long time to realise I could tell my boyfriend anything. A few years in, I got into a bit of a pickle at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Walking out of my show, I was approached by a group of girls and one boy. The boy was quite nervous and beautiful. I had a sense his friends were trying to push him towards me. I chatted to them for a while and thought about what could happen before walking away. Doing the right thing that night began to eat away at me. It took me three days before I could finally say to my boyfriend, I need to talk to you about something that didn't happen in Edinburgh. I felt terrible for even bringing it up. I thought about how awful it would have been if my grandpa had ever said to my grandma that one of his taxi passengers had come on to him and that having spent so many years doing the knowledge, it was a shame not to take the opportunity. I told him I couldn't stop thinking about it. He looked very serious for quite a long time and then said, I'm very pleased that you've told me how you're feeling. I guess what you're saying is, you're a human being. What do you mean? He said, I suppose I also see people I find attractive. I said, right, but I couldn't have slept with him. He said, no. Then added, but it does feel like a shame. We hugged and decided we'd both have a good think about what we wanted and after a few days of discussion, came to the conclusion that we didn't want an open relationship because it sounded a little tiring. But if someone insanely beautiful just presented themselves to you, it would be a shame not to say yes. So, we don't sleep with people outside of the relationship. But in principle, we could if it was unmissable and didn't require any effort. And if such a thing happened, we could talk about it and see how we felt. And then this happened. About a year and a half ago, we went to a party together where we discovered something called MDMA. Oh my God. What kind of a country is this where you can legally buy cigarettes, alcohol and sugar, but it's illegal to be happy? This was the last ever party at the house where the cool parties had happened all those years ago. It was so lovely to be there with someone and without anxiety. We were sat with a couple of other boys, Harry, an artist we both fancy, and Stephen, the boy I should have kissed years ago, but I didn't because I thought he was asthmatic. I felt this pure bliss and couldn't stop smiling. It was like being a baby. I just wanted to touch people. I was staring into Harry's eyes and pulling on his earlobe for maybe an hour. After a while, he said to me, do you want me to kiss you? I said, yes, but you must also kiss my boyfriend. He agreed. So I said, quick, Harry will kiss you now. I watched these two beautiful men kissing and then my boyfriend and I looked at each other and thought, this is a good party. Then another friend squatted down in front of us, the only person who had taken cocaine. She was outraged by the kissing and I said, you're at the wrong party, Koki. She took Harry away, which was sad, but I felt like all the boundaries of society had disappeared. All the boundaries of my own personality had dissolved. There were no boundaries. Then I said out loud, I'm going to hold Stephen's hand. And Stephen pulled his hand away and I thought, oh, there are boundaries. I didn't feel rejected, though. It was just a thing that hadn't happened. I thought, I'll just hold my own hand, which felt wonderful. Then the next day, I did the most brilliant poos. They were just slowly gliding out of me like elegant canoes. And so many like they'd been waiting through 15 years of anxiety. And finally something said, we can leave now. And two days after that, I couldn't stop crying. It took me a few more days to realise that I should feel quite angry that this medicine isn't available in pharmacies. MDMA has been used in couples counselling. It's the pure form of ecstasy, the original name for which was empathy. In this country, it is illegal to have empathy. I've tried many forms of healing, but it was the illegal ones that really did the job. Psychotherapy was incredible, but it was ayahuasca that got to the root of my depression. Magic mushrooms made me realise how ridiculous everything is, and I became funnier, which has been very good for society. 
and I love having acupuncture, but it hasn't ever helped me or my boyfriend kiss Harry. For a while, I thought the only problem in my life now is not being on MDMA. I remember reading at school the book To Kill a Mockingbird, and there was a character in it who went on this heroic journey of self-improvement, attaining a purity. She knew she was dying, and she wanted to give up her addiction to morphine before that moment. And I remember thinking, what a stupid thing to do. <laughs> If I knew I had two months to live, one of the things I would take up would be morphine. <laughs> I have had it for an operation, and it is like a hug from the inside. <laughs> It feels like love, but with none of the bother. <laughs> you wouldn't give it up. You'd say, okay, double the morphine and bring me Atticus Finch. <laughs> but in the end, I realized you only really need to take MDMA once because it's such a great teacher. I've taken it more than once. It allowed an intimacy that I didn't know was possible. I was so shy as a child, so ashamed as an adult, and this medicine dissolved everything. I could just be with another person, touch another person without pretending to be someone better. And with that awareness, at least I can now arrive somewhere between the effects of MDMA and my regular personality. I suppose this hunger for connection is what this has all been about. To be shy or depressed is to be disconnected. To be able to express your entire ridiculous self is to be free. Because at this point in our time, I feel we need to be fully connected to who we are, which is each other, nature, the universe, or at least be in a relationship. Otherwise, you feel alone and you eat everything. <laughs> I know this because I was in a hotel room recently alone. And I'm in a relationship now, and there was a chance he could come out and meet me for the weekend. He didn't. The first thing I do when I get to this hotel room is go to the mini bar which I thought was an act of curiosity because I don't drink alcohol. I'm pretty much a vegan now, so there's nothing in there for me. And I thought it was curiosity, but it was clear loneliness because I then just started opening every drawer in the room, hoping to find a little friend somewhere. <laughs> I order a salad from room service. The reason I became a vegan, by the way, is because last year I became addicted to eating a chocolate cake every night. And... <laughs> I needed a label to stop that from happening. <laughs> Sometimes you need a label. Like the only way to not drink alcohol at a party is to be a recovering alcoholic. Because people say, do you want a drink? I'm a recovering alcoholic. Oh, fair enough. Otherwise it's, do you want a drink? No, thank you. Have a drink. <laughs> it's like these people that only aim is to turn everyone into an alcoholic. And if they meet one, they think, oh, you're done, fine. <laughs> The reason maybe they started giving us popcorn in cinemas so that all senses are then stimulated not just sight and sound but taste touch smell all senses stimulated we've been encouraged over time to numb our feelings no need for feelings by this alcohol you won't have to feel anxious by this ice cream you won't have to feel sad but i think we need to feel as human beings and perhaps there should be an advert that says hey <laughs> why don't you have a little cry <laughs> You're doing so well. You're so beautiful. You don't need anything external. The source of you is pure love. I don't know who would pay for that advert. But... <laughs> All too soon, I have finished the salad, but the film continues. And that isn't enough for me, just sight and sound. So I see the bread that they've brought up, which I didn't order. I don't eat bread, because why would you eat bread? At some point, I might want to be a good father. <laughs> But because I'm alone and it's there, because I'm alone and it's there, I start spreading butter on the bread. I'm eating all the bread, breaking all my rules. I now can't stop thinking about the chocolate in the mini bar. I can't stop thinking about it for half an hour. I think the only way to stop thinking about it is to get it out of the room. Just get it out of the room. And the only way I could do that was to put it into my mouth. <laughs> And that's why he had to be there on that holiday with me. And I'm texting things like, it'd be so lovely if you could come for the weekend. That's not what I mean. What I mean is, marry me. It's an emergency. <laughs> <laughs> we need to feel as human beings. Otherwise, we would just consume and consume until there is nothing left. Why did we almost destroy the earth? Because we felt alone and it was there. But we are not alone. We're so profoundly connected to each other, to nature. Last week, I ate an apple. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Epilogue.
I'm finding it hard to accept this book is finished. I wonder what I've left out, if I've gone as deep as I could have with a little more time or distance. The main question that kept coming up as I was writing was, what is this? I couldn't stop thinking about how real my past thoughts and feelings seemed to be at the time and how silly they appear now. It made me question how much of my present experience would, with enough time, seem completely absurd. I imagine all of it. What are any of us doing? When my grandma died, I remember looking at an old photograph my grandpa had taken of her. She's sitting on a rock on a beach, smiling into the camera. I stared at the photograph for a long time, looking for something meaningful, for an explanation of human existence. She was here, and now she's not here. That was all I could come up with. She was here, and now she's not here. Maybe the only thing to do while we're alive on this planet, with no clear idea why, is to hold each other until we feel a bit less troubled. The final story in this book is about being naked in a room with some other naked people. Thank you for listening. My boyfriend and I recently went on a road trip across the west coast of America. A friend of ours had told us about a sex party happening in one of the states that we were visiting. A real-life orgy in someone's apartment. If the sex dungeon dream was about anything, it was about craving stability, love and intimacy, but also occasionally in the middle of all that comfort and joy, screaming out, shouldn't we be an orgy more often than never? So we decided to go to an orgy. However, a week earlier, another friend invited us to a one-off club night happening in Silver Lake, LA, where, incredibly, one of the rooms turned into a sex party. Suddenly, what began as people dancing became people taking off their clothes and touching each other. It was quite overwhelming, and we weren't sure exactly how involved to get. We thought we'd stick together, and perhaps if we just took our tops off and kissed each other in the middle of all this activity, people would gather around us and applaud. We did some cautious touching of other bodies. I touched the bottom so hard, it was like a cupboard. Yet oddly, as someone who often thinks, we're all animals, why aren't we all just naked and having sex all the time? Once everyone was just naked and having sex, I really wish someone was wearing a hat. I think I learned that I really like story and the intimacy that comes from telling each other who we are. My favourite part of the evening was talking to someone who still had his clothes on and looked as nervous as us. And at the end of the night, having spent so many years saying, why aren't we an orgy? We should be an orgy. Why isn't this an orgy? I ended up thinking, oh God, next week we've got another orgy. Help is published by Random House Audiobooks, a division of the Penguin Random House Group. Copyright Simon Amstel, 2017. Copyright in recording, Random House Audiobooks. Simon Amstel has asserted his right under the Copyright Designs and Patents Act 1988 to be identified as the author of this work. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this programme.